Yes! Wow! Episode 300 in the building. OSD Obsessive Sneaker Disorder. The Soul Doctors are in the building. We have a great show in store for you. The one and only DH will be joining us from that is Darren Hager from Heyday Footwear. Man. What up, Darren? What up? Yo, yo. We are ready. We are ready. This is episode 300. My name is D. Wells, along with all the soul doctors all over the United States, all over the world, coming to you live and direct from the OSD studio, as we do each and every Wednesday. Hopefully, you're ready to walk with us, talk with us, and more importantly, celebrate. We got some great stuff in store for you. Great stuff in store. We got, you know, going back, we, we went, uh, as they call it, DITC, digging in the crates, but this one is much better. So, so let's get to the doctors. Let's get them in. The lab coats are on. We're ready to rock and roll. Get it to step off on the good foot. Let's go straight to straight to straight to straight. Tariq the video freak, aka Dunk on Dunks. Yo 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 yo. What up? What's you ready? Up? I'm ready. Okay. I've been ready. You've been ready. You stay ready. Yeah. The cameras are rolling. He's, you uh, you know Tariq is one of those cats. He doesn't say this often, but he he does shoot people. For a living, exactly. He shoots people for a living. Believe that. Believe that. And the one and only Miss Flower herself. God, oh, Flower, Flower. Flower. Will you sign hey. my book? Hey, this one. Man. Flower, Flower. Yeah. Will you sign where, my book? Where is where is the bag? Where's the bag? <laughs> You like to see the bag or just talk about the bag? No, no, I want the 300. We got to show it. Oh, hold on a moment. Okay. In the meantime, between time, episode 300, the one and only Darren Hager from Heyday Footwear is in the building. Look at Look that. At him. Look at him. It's he knows how to not, do this, son. Look at him. He knows like, how to listen, do this. It's not hype. It's Heyday. Man. It's Heyday today. Episode 300. It's Heyday. Man, welcome back. Welcome back. It was good seeing you. It's you know, I, I saw you Sunday, but... It's great to have you on the show. Great to be back. Episode 300. You were one of the early, early, early interviews in our, you know, in our first iteration of the OSD talk show podcast, going back to episode 11, 11 to be exact. That's right. Can you believe that? Man. So. That was been... before iPhones. You realize that? <laughs> You know what? Word. B.I. Wow. I, I think I was on like a, a Palm Pilot or something back then. You know what? Now that you say that, yes, I was using a trio, and you were probably... You were yeah, probably I was using a trio also. That's right. Yeah, wow. Woo! A lot has changed. A lot has changed. Oh, man. Before iPhones. Now, check that out. Check that, that out as a time crazy. reference. It's like before Christ, after death. Now it's before iPhones. <laughs> man. And after droids. And after droids, right? <laughs> no, it's true. So, man, you've been busy. You've been, you've been hustling and bustling. I mean, you know, some people may know the lineage. Some people may know the history, you know, in terms of your, your not just your, 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 your game, and more importantly, your work, your contribution to the world of footwear. Before Heyday, though, you know, you were doing a lot of other things. But more important, you said, "Okay, I'm sick and tired of helping other people make money. It's time to do yeah. my own damn thing." That's right. Well, I did, I don't know if I thought I was gonna make the money that I did, but I definitely didn't like working for other people. Exactly. At the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, but but let's go back a little bit. Let's take all let's right, take a right. couple steps back. Okay. Uh, you know, talk your upbringing. I remember, um, if I remember correctly, dad's an architect. Yeah. Wow. Mom's an educator. It was video. Right? Am I right? You're correct, yes. sir. Okay. And they instilled in you at a young time, a young age, that you listen. You have to do something that you love, that you're passionate about. So, yeah. so talk about that for a little bit. You know, talk about the upbringing. You know, where DH, you know, got his start. Where, where were you? Where, where, you know, where you come from? Where you been? What you, what you doing now? I grew up in Jersey. Okay. Um, I, I was never really a, a particularly artistic uh, kid. 
despite you know my dad's an architect and and my mom uh, was a painter and uh, and teacher, but I wasn't really that good at at drawing or anything. I I, I didn't I wasn't into sneakers really. I mean it was I grew up in the in the eighties, so back then it's just like you know you put on sneakers and some people had cooler sneakers than others, but it wasn't obviously like it is today. Mm -hmm. um, although I do remember in, in high school. I had uh, blue, white, and black uh, Air Revolutions, like an '87 yes, when they came out, and they were probably 160 bucks then. Um, those were my favorites in high school. Shout out um, to Mark Jackson. <laughs> yes, but you know, I, I actually, I actually failed design class in ninth grade and had to repeat it in eleventh grade, and only got a D minus. Okay, but but design. that says something though. Yeah, well, the teacher. The, the teacher introduced me to Bob Marley, and he, he smoked a lot of weed. He was like a hippie. <laughs> um, he would show up stoned off his ass, like, you know, big leg, <laughs> mustache and everything, like seriously hippie. Um, but, you know, I, I, all these years I've wanted to be like, Mr. Domarecki from Columbia High School in Maple, New Jersey, fuck you with your, your D and your D minus and your F <laughs> and your <laughs> and your <laughs> Look at me now. <laughs> that Mr. Yeah, exactly. I mean, guy's alive anymore, but I've been, I wanted to say that like to the public for years. So Got your Kanye West moment on right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> right. So thank, thank you for that. I appreciate that, D. And hey, hey, that's Paper Chaser. Yep. Yes, Mr. Yeah, Paper yeah. Chaser. You always, you always have the floor here to do whatever you want to do, bro. You know that. Now, thanks. Before, before we let you finish telling your story, one of the things we you have a connection to. The earlier, the, the previous generation before us, if you will, the previous internet sneaker generation, if you will, before us. Here's something that people don't know about you that now when I say this, they're going to be like, wow. All right. Darren Hager, the CEO, the head of Heyday Footwear, is an OG Sneaker Play member. Get out of here. Uh, you find my profile? Uh, Yes, he is. He was one of the first. I was one of the first. That was like in beta before there was beta. Yep. So I just want to throw that one out there to, to show the connection to the youth, if you will. Mm, um, absolutely. Of a absolutely. few years ago up to now. So yeah, that was. Um, I was a designer at Puma. I, I think it was Puma when that launched. Maybe, maybe, yep. maybe I was at Sperry Topsider after that. But actually, you were at Sperry. Before, it was at Sperry. It was definitely you before. Were at Sperry. I tell I you how I remember you at Sperry. Because the first battle that I ever did on Sneaker Play, I don't know if you remember oh. this, Darren. It was versus you. I put up a Baroque Brown leather Delta Force, if you will. And you put up a Sperry Topsider boat shoe. Oh, I remember that. And you yeah. won. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad. That shoe never came out. <laughs> So yeah, so I I I couldn't wait to, for you to come on to, to to refresh your memory on that story. But okay, style. for the young youngsters out there who who have heard the the mythical um, stories about this sneaker play community that is no longer in existence, they ended a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Darren is one of the OG sneaker play members, along with quite a few of us. So. Yeah, those were the days. Oh yeah, so Yo, scrambling boy. scrambling to get an invite. Yep. Word. <laughs> I still had all my invites left. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 let's fast back fast forward back to where we were, Darren. Um, so you know again, just touching on that, even with the point on sneaker play. Um, again, another example of you working for someone else, and ultimately, you know, the passion inside you said, "I need to get up out of here." So, I mean, yeah. elaborate yeah. further on that. You know, the funny thing. I, so, I went to I went to design school. In Boston, I started out at Northeastern. Then I transferred to Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston for architecture. Worked one summer for my dad. Realized I fuck it. I couldn't tell if I hated architecture or I hated working with him. <laughs> <laughs> but that was it for me for architecture. And decided, all right, I'm gonna find something else. And the only other thing I could do was industrial design, which was product design. Mm -hmm. I did that, and I got really into that. Still, no sneakers, you know, playing heavily in my life. You know, back then it was, you know, like Walkman and Power Books, and you know, it was electronics really that people were really into. Uh -huh. um, 
I wound up getting uh, my first co-op job was for a model maker that would do like uh, prototyping, and I, I cut my thumb off on a table saw. So that was the end of uh, my model making career. And your thumb's back. It's back, but you see that giant scar? Yeah. That, right, so that was my model making career. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job at Toy Biz, mm. which was a toy company that had the license for all the Marvel Comics stuff, plus uh, like Hercules and Xena and Ninja Turtles and like tons of toys. And I was, at the time, I was like, all right, you know, I'm kind of like the X Men cartoons on Saturdays and stuff, but I wasn't really into comic books or anything. Mm -hmm. Everyone else at this company, their only goal in life was to work for Marvel Comics. So, like, mm -hmm. they saw working for the toy company that made the Marvel toys as, like, a stepping stone to that. And I was, I was never, like I said, I was not really an artist growing up. So I was never really, uh, I was never really that good of an illustrator. Mm -hmm. And all these other kids coming out of FIT would just blow me away, like, drawing Spider-Man and stuff. So... I got out of I got out of the toys after about two or three years. Really hated it. Wound up getting a, a job up here in Boston for like a, a little design consulting firm uh, in footwear, and that was my start in footwear in um, 1997, I think. Um, was here for a year. Went out west. Worked for a hiking boot company called High Tech Sports. Lived out in the Bay Area in Oakland. We know High Tech. Um, I was at High Tech for about two years as a design manager. Uh, moved back to New York, worked for Donna Karen Active, doing sneakers for I think a month. A month. A month. <laughs> that was it. But, uh, it didn't work out. Um, at the same time, though, I had an offer from uh, from Puma, uh, so I took a job with Puma, and this was in in I think '99 or 2000, and Puma was like not on the map. I mean, I don't mm. know if they're on the map anymore, anyway. But this was right, like, the Mastro had just come out. Oh, wow. All right, it was like the Mastro, the, the Easy Rider, um, the GV, which was one of my favorites. Black, 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 black gum GV mm. was, uh, was one of my favorites there. But so I started working there. I was there for about three, four years. I had a couple of medium hits, but nothing, you know, huge. Um... Wanted to wanted to move up in the world. I had done a lot of traveling for Puma. Um, mm -hmm. I've been went on like uh, inspiration trips. Design footwear designers always have to go on an inspiration trip at least a couple times a season. You know, you got to go to Tokyo to the car show. You got to go to Barcelona to see Gaudi's Cathedral. Uh, I went to Hawaii to research sandals for the sandal team. And realize that Hawaiians wear the cheapest five dollar rubber flip flops. They don't care. So mm. that was like a week in Hawaii on the way to China. Um, so I did a lot of traveling for Puma, but uh, my career wasn't moving up there. Mm. Uh, I wound up going a completely different different direction for more money and a higher position uh, at Sperry Topsider in uh, here in Lexington, Massachusetts, and that was doing boat shoes. And that was uh, in two thousand four. And they thought that, as they still do every season, that boat shoes were going to be the new trend. Like, you know, preppy, nautical, you know, all the cool kids will be wearing boat shoes. And while Sperry has done amazingly well, I don't mm -hmm. think that demographic, like the sneakerhead that they were aiming for, really ever gave a crap about boat shoes. Um, Way after I left, you know, they did uh, some collabs with uh, Band of Outsiders, which I guess were kind of cool. Um, although that, that, I guess that's more almost like contemporary uh, mm -hmm. than even streetwear or anything. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I was starting to get into sneakers then. I remember I, I, I got my first um, Nike ID. Um, I got a pair of uh, Dunks that were super super cool uh, down on Mercer Street in New York. And I'd wear them to the office, and my boss was like, are you sure you want to be here? Because everyone else is wearing polos and Sperry boat shoes. And, you know, you're in here wearing, you know, those, those hip-hop <laughs> shoes. Uh, are you sure you want to – maybe you should be doing the sneaker, you know, work for a sneaker company or something. You know, you're, you think you're too cool for, for this. I'm like, no, you, you hired me from Puma to bring some cool into this old man boat shoe brand. 
Mm. So it was like fighting against the current. Like uh. those those um, high tops that uh, I beat Paper Chaser in on, on sneaker play were one I was trying to basically take Air Force One influence and bring it to a boat shoe, but using real boat shoe uh, cue, like design cues, like the collar and the rawhide laces mm-hmm. and an existing cup sole that they had, and the, like. 2004, 2005, they just, they, they didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to hear from it. Yeah. Um, I eventually left somewhat of my own accord, but I, I did get six months severance uh, when I left. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna try to do it myself. You know, mm. fuck these guys. Um, you know, they, you know, they want to just do boat shoes and old man shoes, fine. I'm going to work on stuff myself. So I started freelancing for other brands, namely their number one competitor, Sebago, which was like mm. awesome. Um, but I, I did a lot of work for Saucony and Atonic doing like technical running shoes. Um, I started doing a lot of uh, tactical boots. Um, a friend of mine uh, owned, or owned, he sold at New Balance, owned a, a military boot company called OTB that he, he sold to New Balance a few years ago, and then they shut it down. Mm. But uh, <laughs> I, I did tons of cool stuff like with the Navy SEALs. I actually went to uh, to a cocktail party at Outdoor Retailer, a trade show for sort of the outdoor world um, out west, and it was 50 active Navy SEALs. Mm. And just to... because the, the boots that we were doing were for them to wear under their swim fins on a mission, and so the the boots that we did, the, it had offset lacing, like on a uh, like on a Nike uh, Mercurial Vapor soccer, mm. boot. you know, like a lot of soccer boots, they put the lacing off to the side so that the uh, you get better ball control, and when you hit the ball, your it's not hitting your instep with the laces. So we did that. We did a lot of really cool stuff for for these Navy Seals, and I did a lot of that. And eventually, I was just like, you know, I, I want to do my own thing. And I really, you know, I was a designer for 10 years at different shoe companies, but at shoe, you know, brands, big brands, there's different, there's, first of all, there's different designers for all different categories. Right. There's so many other jo- roles, so many other jobs at those companies that other people do that my job was to draw. And that was it. There were, there were other people, there are developers who basically interpret your designs and, tell, and basically work with the factory to get your, your pretty drawings made into shoes. And then, you know, there were certainly other people that handled uh, the shipping of the shoes from China, um, people that worked with the factories in China, uh, people that did the marketing. I mean, there was no social media then, but there was public relations and stuff. And I didn't know how to do any of that. Mm. But I was like, all right, I'm going to... I'm going to try it. I found through a friend who was still uh, working at my previous company, uh, a factory that was willing to you know, help me out. And I'll show you what I guess I'm sort of embarrassed by now. <laughs> um, this actually did debut on Sneaker Play. Um, <clears throat> like the first shoe that I did, and, and what I wanted to do with the first shoe was I wanted to do something sort of Ba- you know, basketball, retro basketball influence, but instead of doing it on a traditional cup sole, like, you know, Dunk, Air Force One, etc., I wanted to do it on, like, a Red Wing-style work boot bottom, mm. but not have a boot upper. And, you know, I, I, am, I am kind of embarrassed by this. I'm, I'll, I'll hold it up so you can see it. This was, like, I, a, me- I remember that. You know, here's, like, you know, the work boot red bottom. Um... You know, didn't do much. Didn't do much sales. Uh, eventually, I did kind of um, find sort of my my design rhythm, and I have the very first pullover, which is basically when the factory like makes the very first sample pattern, but there's no bottom on it. Mm. So the super shift, which kind of became my number one style, this is. Mm. But this is the uh, the very first one. 
that I got from that factory, and I it was just a really unique pattern. The the eye stay comes back much further than it does normally on a high top. Normally your your eye stay, see how it's here, flows right up. So I had the eye stay going way back, which would then allow the tongue to take this really you know have a big tongue, but it wasn't just a tall tongue sort of coming out of nowhere. It was very rounded and organic, and it was just a really unique shape. Um, that I, I wound up taking that design and spinning it off into a number of different ones, and then there were other designs. I mean, D, I know you had D's, I think, in black, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yep. This was, um, you know, the, that work boot bottom, different one. Um, this one's in white patent and ballistic nylon. I did these in a bunch of colors. Um, later on in 2010, I did a, a really cool version of, of that one, with uh, a collab with a, I guess if you're into salvage denim, it's a pretty big name. Um, Sugarcane Denim Company from Japan. Uh, yeah. Salvage they're denim. You know, they're using like denim looms from the 1840s or something. Um, you know, Japanese are really into that sort of authentic workwear uh, look. So this was one of uh, three styles. I imported uh, all the actual components and denim and materials from Japan at great cost. So you can see there's the actual selvage denim on the edge, the, the actual yeah, copper see. rivets. This uh, striped canvas was from a, like a, a work shirt, like sort of a railroad inspired thing. You know, here's Sugarcane Denim Company branding. Yeah. Um, the lining material. It was all denim as well, wasn't it? It's not denim. It's actually no. kind of a it's a woven canvas, but it was the pocket lining from the jeans. Oh. Wait, okay. I'll show you. Here's another one. This one it, it was awesome. This was a boot, another boot. I took their denim and did it inside out because I never really liked that denim on denim. Like, what do you wear with? Sneakers made out of denim, <laughs> right? You know, because it you never matches. It. You literally flipped it. But I flipped it inside out, and it was ah. nice, which I thought was really cool. And there, and there's the actual, there's the actual selvage. Um, and then check this out. This was the pocket lining from the jeans, koi fish. Oh. Hmm. So you know these were super cool, and here's like the uh, the actual button from from the jeans. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was sort of like a start into collabs. Um, you know, that was like super limited. It was too expensive. Um, you know, they were like 300 bucks at retail. And um, I did another collab with uh, with Nuka watches that mm -hmm. did okay. But, at, you know, at that, going into to 2010, I was doing design and running the brand the way everyone is supposed to which is, or at least supposed to, starting then, which was you sell to, to stores, you go to trade shows, you start, you know, you're supposed to aim for the high-end boutiques to begin with, and then you work your way down throughout the seasons so you get to more mass market. Um, I found that while I did get, I got placement in like all the stores I wanted pretty much, none of them could really sell it. I, I don't know exactly what the reason was. Like, sell-through on a lot of stuff was just never that great. But, I mean, I had the brand in... I got a 10-door test at Finish Line, but we did an SMU for them. Five, we did five SMUs, but they, did it, they, want, they didn't want the Super Shift, which was, like, my number one style. They wanted the Shift, which didn't have the straps, and then they made me do the worst colors and materials ever. Mm -hmm. Like they were just terrible, and they didn't sell. I mean, you know, they paid me fifty-four grand, and they got fifteen hundred pairs of shoes that I don't know what they did with them, but I did what they wanted. But all right, so Finish Line wasn't wasn't the right, uh, you know, wasn't the right retailer for me. Um, I had stuff on Amazon all along. They would. The funny thing about Amazon is that they would just keep ordering. Like you would tell them what you want to sell them and the quantities, and they would just write the check. There was no buyer. Like, they met you once, approved you, and for three years, they 
practically kept me in business, buying so much shoes from me that they never sold. They're still up on the site, like stuff from five years ago. Wow. Um, <laughs> You know, so that was kind of amusing. Um, you know, I was on Revolve. Revolve Clothing I did really well at. That's like a really contemporary um, online store uh, based in L.A., uh, but worldwide. But I did really well with them. I was on ASOS. Um, I did Underground Station, which is part of, you know, Journeys. Um, yeah. I had stuff in Shoe City, which is like a pretty big chain down on the mid-Atlantic coast. Um I was on DJ Premium. I mean, you know, like from regional 20 to 50 door chains, I was in it. I was in Oak in Brooklyn in, and in Manhattan. You know, super contemporary, everything black, crazy. I did a couple of SMUs for them that did well, and then it just stopped. Um, and, you know, the little guys, there were so many, like, little hip-hop stores down in the southeast. Like, you know, they had one or two stores, and it was all, like, the nastiest stuff, like, like Apple Bottom teens and like, you know. <laughs> and for some reason, they were all owned by um, like Syrians or Moroccans, like like all these Arabs, for some reason, all were like in Louisiana and Georgia, and they would all own shoe stores, and they were all like sort of almost like a network. And they'd go to the, show, to the trade shows, and they'd all order stuff, and I, at the time, I, I never had any financing. I was never factored. I didn't have any investors. I didn't have any partners, nothing. So I would have to order the shoes after I got the orders from, let's say, the trade shows and having my sales reps out on the road. And, you know, when you when a, when a store writes an order, they, they're signing a purchase order. Right. Where I'm, I'm going to order this amount of shoes, and I agree to pay for it. And these guys would basically give me their orders. I would make the shoes at the factory for these, you know, 20 stores, 50 stores, whatever it was. I, Heyday never got that big. Oh, I think we're probably in about 100 stores max at the same time. And then when it would come time, it was around 2009, 2010 when the economy was going, all these little stores, oh, yeah, that was my partner. I can't accept that. Uh, he ran no. off with my credit card. You're going to have to take that shit back. I don't have room in my stock room. You're going to have to take it back. I just refused UPS. Or, yeah, you know what? Your stuff from last season didn't really sell. I don't want it. And I was just like, so I what do you So what do you do? Contract. You know? What do you and, do at that point? Do you tell them no? You basically say, pay up, sucker? Or do you, do you fight them? You, you would try to get them. I would call them and have, you know, I used to have the sales manager who was like, he liked being an asshole. Like, that was his calling in life, was to, to, beat, <laughs> to beat these these store owners down, man. You know, let me be the bad guy. You be the good guy. I'm like, all right. And, you know, we would try to get paid. Didn't always happen. And, you know, you try to sell the shoes somewhere else. I, I wasn't selling online at, myself at that time. My website was just like a catalog. I mean, it was nothing. Um... And 2010, sales manager quit on me. He wasn't making enough money because all the orders, all the people were canceling their orders. Because the little guys had no credit. I was in oh, frankly, I was in five doors of Bloomingdale's for for four seasons. But the stuff didn't sell through fast enough for them. It's not that it didn't okay. sell; it just didn't sell fast enough. So. I'd call up Bloomingdale's just to fuck with them. Be like, hey, you guys carry Hit 8 footwear? No, I don't think so. You know, wow. you want to hear that? Yeah. Yep. And, and it just shows that, you know, yes, great, you're in Bloomingdale's. You know, on 57th Street or 59th Street in New York, and I was in L.A. in the Grove and Aventura down in Florida and in Atlanta. And they had so many shoes and so many brands, and they had like four or five pairs from me. Against you know what what does a, a department store have like for the big brands like dozens or hundreds of SKUs? They didn't know how to sell my shoes. They didn't care. They weren't selling that many. So it was just not you know you salespeople like to sell the thing that sells the most. So I was like, all right, my sales manager quit on me. He took all his sales reps with him. I understood, but I was like, what the fuck am I gonna do now? I got no sales reps. So I was like, all right, maybe I could do this myself. 
like literally myself. Um, I never had anyone else working for me. I mean, there were sales, you know, a couple of sales reps on commission and a sales manager, and I have right. a guy in China that, that works with me. But there was no, never anyone else here, but I was like, okay, I have to do this myself, myself. And I, oh, I had a warehouse out in L.A., like a third-party warehouse that would ship stuff at what I didn't realize was really great cost. Like, it, they would charge me 10 or $12 to ship a pair of shoes. Oh. Hmm. You know, it, it was like $5, $4 in and out, $3 for the box, 50 cents to put the label on it, 50 cents for the label. Like, they were nickel and diming me like crazy. And, you know, like I said, I was a designer previously. I didn't, I went into design because I didn't want to do business. And I always felt like I wasn't good at math and, you know, like I just couldn't do that stuff. So I'll just be a designer. And then all of a sudden, I'm doing all that stuff or trying to. So I decided right, I'm going to sell it myself. I don't need yeah. stores. Fuck all the stores. I stopped selling to all the stores, literally all of them. And I was going to sell it myself. I spent some money to have my guy redo the website, uh, you know, turn it into an e-commerce site. Um, and it's it was very slow. You got to remember when you're selling to stores, selling wholesale. Hopefully, assuming that they're buying and paying, you know, a store might order 20 pairs or 30 pairs or right. 50 pairs or you know, sometimes you get a two or 300 pair order, and then you get that Amazon or or finish line order for a couple thousand pairs. But while you're making not that much money on those because of the way the shoe markup is from manufacturer to, to, you know, from factory to brand to wholesaler or distributor and then to retail, it's getting marked up about five times. So uh, the shoes, you don't make that much money, which is why you have to do volume. Mm -hmm. Selling it yourself direct, you're going to make a lot more margin, but you're selling basically one pair at a time. Right. So, you know, the volume goes way down. Uh, but, yeah, but mm. it took a long time, and it started to work. Then, of course, you know, I've been through four factories in six years. Four and six, okay. Yeah, generally okay. every year and a half or two years, they, they decide they don't want to work with you anymore, and they, and they don't say, you know, I don't think this relationship's working out anymore. They say nothing. Oh, yeah, everything's going to be done perfect right on time. No problem. And then they, and then you they left ship you the shit where everything's like, like, oh, it's supposed to look like that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wow. serious. I mean, this happens, this happens with every shoe company, but Gee. the degree to which you are able to recover from it and, 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 and handle it depends on how much money you have, basically. Mm. Um, so every time I go to a new factory, the old factory, they, they would have fucked something up, and I wouldn't pay them. So they wouldn't give me my molds back, like, you know, for the outsole molds and your upper molds. Like, there's all costs involved, a couple thousands of dollars per style and per even per size. Where they're like, hey, you know what? You're not paying us. Fuck you. We're keeping your shit. So then you go to a new factory, and then and it's like, okay, it's all another over twenty again, grand, right? To remake the patterns for the for the same shoes. And maybe you go to the next factory, and they do something better than the previous one did, right? So I was over in China in October to have my holiday production. Uh, you know, like basically to sign off on it. They were supposed to be shipping it that week. They did the worst possible job you could ever imagine. They cut every corner they could think of mm. just to save a buck. But by that point, they had given me um, basically credit, like payment terms. So I didn't pay anything. Like I was going to pay them after they shipped it. So mm. they fucked everything up. And my, uh, my developer that works for me is a huge Taiwanese guy. He's about 6'3", he played football for uh, University of Mississippi, and his brother apparently is 6'8", like I don't know how many 6'8", Taiwanese guys there are, but it's his brother. <laughs> like if you ever hear that, it's this guy's brother. So, my developer, he, he actually got into a fist fight while I was there on the production line with this very skinny Chinese guy and threw him over the heat tunnel 
like, you know, you see like a like a roller, like of all the shoes, you know, kind of going by as they're 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 getting warmed up and yeah. they're, they're curing. Through, he threw him through. over that because he was so pissed that they were they fucked it up. They admitted after much coaxing that they fucked it up. Hey, wait, can I curse on this show? Absolutely, you all can right. say whatever you want. All right, just so, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so, so they they the back and completely. Fucked it up, and I said, like, right, "Fuck you! I'm not paying you." They're like, "Okay, fuck you! You're not getting your molds." But I had I had no holiday production for 2013. I had to cancel it. But I didn't I didn't I wasn't sure exactly what was going to happen. Mm. I was lucky. I found a new factory that, for a lot of money, was willing to make the 50 pairs or so that I had sold <clears throat> as pre-orders. As pre-orders, right? But I didn't have that money to pay, to refund the people because I had already used it for payroll and other things. So I had to I had to get this new factory like up and running very quickly to make the shoes. And it was like literally 50 random pairs across four or five styles in different sizes. Like it was you know three pairs of size seven, nine pairs of size ten. You know just okay. random. Not 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 sell. full size runs. It was all it was all stuff that people had pre-ordered, and the pre-orders were only up for two weeks in October. By the time I got to China, two weeks later, I, I took it off the website, so I had nothing. I, my last shipment was in October, and I have like twenty pairs left of that. Like literally, I have nothing to sell. I have, I if you're a size four or fourteen, I have shoes for you. Everything in between that. Sold out. Got nothing. But I have a new factory now. Okay. And I have some new collabs that I've got. The stuff is up for pre-order. It's delivering probably in late May uh, or early June. And I figured I'd show you guys. I actually just got these samples on Monday from the from the factory. These are 99% there samples. Show us. Or they know I needed the samples for photo shoots, and you know right. they're already making the shoes. I should have had the confirmation samples two months ago. So these samples don't have any of the logos on the footbeds. Why well, I don't know, but they don't. So this this one uh, here's the super ship, all black, but now we're using real seriously premium Napa leather. Like, this is so soft. It's, it's amazing. And the awesome thing is you would expect that with Napa leather, something that's really soft, that you would get a ton of creasing and wrinkling in the toe box. And these don't. I mean, these stay super fresh. And this is just a black super shift, white cup sole. Strap is one of the big features. Strap is removable and double-sided. And you can wear it about 20 different ways. And here's, a, here's another way of wearing the strap. Mm. And, you know, these things are so comfortable. I, I wish you could touch it. Touch it. Everybody put your finger up to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Napa. Yeah. Touch it. <laughs> it's, 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 this is really fine. Um, now, Darren, is it, is it safe to say this has been your most popular model to date? Uh, yes. The pythons were really popular too. Like, this was uh, this is one of the few I have left. This one's in hot pink. But I had been doing python uh, embossed leather all along. But I I was lucky enough to basically get an amazing licensing uh, deal with a video game uh, called Saints Row the Third. I don't know if you guys yeah. heard of Saints Row. It's like sort of a Grand Theft Auto. But actually raunchier and dirtier. Uh, and our friend, the video freak, probably knows that game very well. Wait, I, right, I, Mr. I, Sykes? Yeah, much raunchier. Show yes, ideas. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, yes, much raunchier. Yeah. Well, the really sick thing about this was the shoes were actually in the game. Wow. All right. 
Like I worked with, with the developer. That's dope. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, we can see it. So you would, if you know the game, you would walk. Your character would walk into the clothing store, Planet Saints, and there would be a glass wall of purple Heydays. And then you would select, you know, Heyday Footwear, Purple Python, Super Shift for your character. Um, and that was, was that was that was amazing. Uh, getting that deal, that was partly just networking and knowing the right people. Um, but that brought me so much uh, so much traffic uh, because Saints Row is a really big game. I mean, they had hundreds of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter, and the the publisher was really great. Like they partnered with me big time. They would do blog posts. We did video interviews. We did giveaways. Um, you know, they worked to make sure that we were selling those shoes, and and we did. I mean, for a good year and a half, um, you know, I was blowing through those pythons at 160 bucks a pop. Um, what year was, was that, um, Darren? Yeah. What year was that? Uh, 2000. The game came out in no uh, November of 2011. And the last one that I had was February of 2013. So there were five gangs in the game, and we did a different uh, a different shoe for for each gang. So um, in 2011, you had your own shoes in the video game. Yeah, I mean it was it, it, the the game sold eight million copies. Is is that before Nike put their shoes in a video game? What video game are they in? In NBA 2K, whatever. Um. I don't know, but the no, they did it for a while. But here's the thing: yeah, the shoes in the game were unique. Like they were exclusive to that, and we were the only ones that sold them because we were selling direct. So mm. you could actually buy the shoes in the game. I mean, yes, you could, you could buy, the buy shoes whatever in the game. games were in probably in 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 uh, NBA 2K, but I don't know. I just feel like it it was it was different. There weren't any other branded shoes in the game. Every other shoe that you could pick for your character, and there were hundreds, were just generic, you know, basically like super knockoffs, I guess. Mm. Um, but, you know, they were like thigh-high leather go-go boots, and, you know, like, you could pick anything. You know, you could... It was crazy, this game. It's like, it's, you'd expect most games like that, you know, you carry a baseball bat or a crowbar. In that game, it was... I'm not kidding. A three-foot purple dildo. Rubber. <laughs> Smack someone with a with a dildo and, and and you know over their head smash them with this giant dick, like that's the type of game it was. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, a, they got a YouTube video with that. You can run around and just. It's absolutely on YouTube. Go find. Yeah, there's a YouTube video running around just slap somebody with it. <laughs> I I used to just pick that one weapon and just I would just do that one weapon. Yeah, I tried to <laughs> slap oh, somebody at work with that, but. <laughs> So you know that that was like a high point, um, you know, sort of for the brand, um, uh -huh. you know, being able to do that and being in the, you know, it's it's in the game. It's shipped on the disc. I'm not talking downloadable content. It's on the disc. It's on the disc itself. So yeah. you got front and center it's forever visibility. Yeah, it's forever. Um, you know, and then I went I went. To the uh, to the licensing show in Vegas, which is like a you know a trade show where every movie studio publisher, you know whatever you could think of, wants to get their character on some product. And, you know, fucking Angry Birds, you know, on pillowcases and and you know, anything, right? Mm -hmm. So I was able to pick up another license for free. Usually, you got to pay up front. Like you have to guarantee that you're going to sell. A certain amount of shoes or product, and pay them beforehand. I couldn't do that. I didn't have any money, so I was able to get a license for for Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock, which was like from the '80s on HBO, and it, Ooh, Jim Henson did the Muppets and Sesame Street. Um, Fraggle Rock was like the alternate universe where like they were all musicians and whatever. I thought it'd be. I thought it could work. It could be kind of cool. I got no support. From Jim Henson Productions at all. Like I was so spoiled from Saints Row, from them. Like, you know, they 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 were great to work with. Like they really helped me sell those shoes. 
Jim Henson. They spelled the name wrong. Paper Chaser, you did too. So <laughs> um, he got it right though. Um, H capital H E Y capital D A Y is not the way to do it. Um, but like they spelled the name wrong in the press release. Um, they like they just did everything wrong, and I made 50 pairs. I'll show you the shoe. Maybe it wasn't the right first shoe to make. All right. So the problem with 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 designing around that was that the colors were like you know from the 80s, and they're like 80s you know like rubber puppets and shit. And so just imagine those, like, Sesame Street 80s colors. You know, I, I always thought that the uh, the Adidas, the, the teddy bears, like, that they were not really all that wearable. Right? I mean, sometimes you see, like, some Japanese kid wearing them. But so I wanted to do something that I thought would maybe be more wearable than that. I don't think they were, though. I only made 50 pairs, and I still have at least 15 or 20. But um, this was Gobo. I remember, yeah. Like the main character. And I did it with this insane pink fur for the tongue lining. Mm. Originally, I was going to have. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Origin oh. This is what I was originally going to do. Yeah. It was removable. And I was like, there's, you know, there's a fraggle in your shit. Yes, exactly. Which I thought at first was genius, but then the. We had the shoe factory couldn't make these, so they had to go to a you know a plush toy factory, and they wanted a crazy amount of money to make this. Mm. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna skip that, and we'll just do it like this, and then put you know put this illustration on here, and you know they didn't sell, and I I, I could see why. I mean, who the fuck's gonna wear this? Um, and you know I can say that about my stuff. You know some stuff I. There's some shoes that I love and I wear all the time, and there's mm -hmm. others that, you know what, I just don't like them. I've designed them, I've sold them, and I hate them. And, <laughs> you know, some of them are like that. That's how it is. There's um, a quotable for the night. So, you know, there's that one. And then I did another one, which was really dope. And But I you got to remember, I had no money, right? I had no money to produce it. So... Apparently, when you're a licensee, like when you have the license for someone else's property, you're supposed to seek pre-approval. Mm. Things like I, I had, they had signed off on the designs and seen the shoes, because there's another one, and um, you know, the creative director loved it, but I didn't have the money, so I put it up on Kickstarter, and mm. I didn't tell them I put it up on Kickstarter. And it was up for five days, and then I got a uh, like a, a cease and desist letter from their from Jim Henson's legal team saying, you know, you didn't seek pre-approval to do it this way. This makes us look bad. We're a family company. This makes it look like we don't have the money to produce our own things. And I'm like, you know, Kickstarter is getting to be really big. You know, this would be great. Jump on it, business. right? Exactly. So you know, this was for Sprocket the dog. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think this one was more, a lot more wearable. This was gray suede on the Super Deb. Yep. And he's got the dog collar. Mm. There's a little branding there. And then the um, fur. So I wanted to make these, but didn't make it. I actually had a I had someone offer me two fifty for these samples the other day. Sent him a PayPal request. I'm still waiting. <laughs> hey, if you if you if you got a size twelve in the doozers, I take it, D. The doozers. Yeah, I'm, I'm size nine, man. I, I'm size ah, nine. Ah. I got I got tons of size nine samples here, man. Simple you want the sugar canes? I got the oh, sugar man. cane samples. Simple life. Killing, killing me with that sample life, right? <laughs> Everyone's always wants to make size fourteen samples. Yeah, exactly. Come on, son. I was fucking size 14 and they wouldn't be. I'm a little white guy, man. Five, five, nine, size nine and a half shoe. That's that's what I'm making because I have about 500 pairs of shoes in my closet. That's funny. And they're all heyday. Um, so that one was cool. Um, here, here, here's another one that's coming out. Um, it's coming out in May. Okay. Um, this is another super shift. It's the white nap of leather. But then I'm using embossed stingray. I was gonna say, it looks oh, embossed stingray. Okay. 
Yeah, you see the stingray? Ah. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Anita Heat. Can someone get in the club wearing those? Not if you sleep Ooh. like that. I know. What do you yeah. think? Come on. I can, I can, be, I can see little somebody in. It, it would have to be summertime, though. Okay. Yeah, I thought he was asleep. <laughs> Nah, man, my eyes are just low, dog. So I was to say, yeah. So that's the that's the one with the the Napa leather now on yeah, the left. Yeah, black, the black one. Let me see the black one. Let me see the black one. Hold that black one up. Mm. Yeah, that black one. You can get in. You're good. You know, this one. This one's actually selling better than the black one. Surprisingly. Yeah, that, that's that's the summertime. If I'm in a good mood, type. Take that off. Other side is stingray. Ah, okay. What's the smallest size those come in? Uh, four, I think. Uh oh. Come Men's on, flower. 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 You got you covered. You got I need those covered. black ones in the six. Uh, there may be like one left. I sold a ton to a to a dance crew, to a hip hop crew, um, up here uh yesterday, like a couple grand, um. I know they took all the fours, the fives. There may be a six left. Okay, there you go. Uh, so there's that one, and then um, you guys. I wonder. I'm curious how popular or known this guy is. He's my he's my boy though. I've known him for a long time. He's been a brand ambassador. You guys know Young Scrap? Mm-hmm. So, I do. You know, songwriter. He's done a lot of stuff. He's got something coming out with DJ Mustard. So yep, yep. We did this one for him. Oh, okay. Why yes, okay. Ink scrap. This is the black napa leather, black sole, red contrast stitching, gold hardware. Those those are selling like hell down down here. I was gonna say that's in the, that's at Atlanta, right there, yeah. true and true. Yeah, that, they'll sell like hell down here. And you could get in the club. Yeah, actually, you could give me. See that nice sheen on that leather? <laughs> you know, that's not that's not PU like on a Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Sneak her down. Sneak her down. Um, and then the last one. Um, you guys got to go on the website and look at the pictures. But I found over the last year that you know we we've done a lot of placement with uh, with hip-hop dancers because I've been working with So You Think You Can Dance for the last oh, okay. three years. So my shoe has been worn by the choreographers and the contestants um, up to the finale show uh, for all the hip-hop numbers uh, for the last three years. And I, I started going to all the dance conventions that would come through and they're huge. Like a thousand kids, mostly like 10 to 18 year old girls, come to a, you know, like to a hotel for the weekend and you know they've got the choreographers from So You Think You Can Dance, uh, te like doing a master class, like teaching. So you got like a thousand kids in these classes in these ballrooms, and all their parents are just waiting around the hotel all weekend. And I, I strategically have given pairs to all of the choreographers, so that they're on stage wearing my mm. shoes, and then I have my table set up outside, and I sell a lot of shoes to these girls, mostly girls. Mm. Um, but then I found that bodybuilders and fitness models were wearing my shoes just randomly sort of through Instagram. Uh, I'm seeing these gigantic bodybuilders wearing them. And, you know, you think, gotta think, all right, this guy's like 280, jacked. You know, he doesn't stand out enough. So, you know, he wants, he wants really dope shoes. So I started reaching out to them. And, like, there's, there's nobody in that market. You know, I mean, yeah, you have like Reebok doing CrossFit stuff and you know Nike training, but that's that's really more for the much more performance end of it. Whereas you just have some very big guys and and their very jacked female partners that just you know they like high tops, they like sneakers, they want to do something different. So the 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 South Beach colorway, this this chick's really hot here. Um, the, South, the South Beach colorway is I'm doing as a collab with a, a very, very well-known Brazilian uh, fitness model, competitor, personal trainer, and entrepreneur. She's like 25, I think. Um, 
she's a major sneakerhead. She's probably got like a hundred pairs of foams and LeBrons and stuff. I mean, she's crazy. Uh, she's got like ten vitamin stores and a gym down in Florida. Um, and she happened to have bought a pair of Super Shift Ninjas from me, the all black canvas ones. And I so basically saw, okay, this was in December. It's like, all right, she's got six hundred and fifty thousand followers on Instagram. I'm gonna talk to her now. It's 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 April. She has 810,000 followers on Instagram. So, so she liked the LeBron South Beaches. And I was like, all right. She's also got a lot of tattoos. Nice ones. You want to put her name on a strap? Yeah, let me show you that one. Bella Falcone. Bella Falcone. Oh, so, okay. For those of you who need a better illustration of what Brian's talking about, I have Brian's uh, website up, shared on my screen, which Dio highlight. Yeah, I see it. So, take chances is um, her sort of motto and one of her tattoos on her wrist. Um, here's her Bella Falcone fitness uh, logo. And, you know, these are unisex, gray Napa leather. Uh, comes with black laces as well. Um, got uh, metal aglets. <clears throat> black side has, it's not high potato, printed in the seafoam green. And these are literally like flying off the shelf. I mean, uh, from all over the country, plus obviously she's Brazilian, and like they're going ape shit. And in Brazil, they charge a 60% import tax Ooh. on shoes. So these shoes are $400 in Brazil. Ooh. And uh, she just got her pair of size six samples today. She's going to be doing a photo shoot um, hopefully in the next day or two. And I just had my photo shoot with my photographer yesterday on all this new stuff. So I just started posting up uh, all the product photos. If you click through from the from the homepage, you can see all the new photos. Um, but you know these are pretty dope. And I've got one more that people are asking about. I made it, but I don't know if I'm going to make it at this point. But I'll, I don't know. I'll show it to you guys. Um, you tell me what you think. I mean, I'm. I could go either way. Purple, gray, and uh, kind of a, a gold, light orange. Zell's wax. What's the other color of the strap? The reversible color of the strap, what is it? Uh, it, it would be purple, I think. The factory did this one in black, which they shouldn't have. Okay. Um, so, you know, I might do something with these. I, I posted some photos on Instagram of these sort of in the background. Hey, I don't see those on the site. I want to get those, but yeah, you know, basically, I gotta sell. I gotta sell all these mm -hmm. uh, uh, first right. before I can do it. Right. right, right. And you know, I I gotta pay the factory in about 25 days, and I'm still short a few grand. So help me out. Um, that bread. So you know, being being a uh, a brand owner in this day and age is, is really tough. Um, you know, there's definitely some of my competitors have gone out of business. You know, anyone remember Vale Project? I mean, you know, that was uh, when I started kind of my main competitor. Obviously, Super's still doing well. Creative Rec, I, I think they fell off completely. I know they got sold uh, a couple of months ago to some uh, venture capital firm for about eight or nine grand. And I remember maybe three, four years ago, they were doing eighty million. And they got they just got sold for like eight. Um, wow. Yeah. Eight or nine? Are you saying? Are you saying? Are you mean eighty? No, they got sold for eight. I think eight or nine million. But four oh. years ago, they did eighty million in sales. Okay. Um, I believe part of that drop off was because they over distributed. Like you could get them everywhere, and then Chic out in the West Coast is like a pretty big chain. Cheap uh, shit. Mostly cheap shit. Uh, was a big, big buyer of theirs, and then she knocked them off. Like, ooh, exactly. The, the, what was their main model? It's like area with the, the Velcro forefoot strap. She not, just copy it and said, fuck you. We're doing our own thing. I think they got sued, but, you know, that was sort of the downfall there. Um, you know, Clay, I, I always had respect for, for, for Sung Kim at Clay, although his stuff was just very, too classic for me. He's nice stuff. He's a good designer. Met him a few times. Um, I like Clay here too. 
you know, but I don't know. I don't ever see anyone wearing clay. The, the, like the five times I've ever seen someone wearing clay, it's it's the Russell, which is like the high top. Now he's doing like, you know, tassel loafers and other stuff that I think is, you know, it's cool. I just don't know who wears it. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was at um, Sneaker Social at Gillette Stadium uh, this Sunday where I saw D and uh, saw, you know, obviously DJ Clark Kent came over and was looking at the stuff. And I was, I have to say I was pretty depressed. There were, and this is me being real with you guys, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I, I had done a sneaker con event last summer in Boston where, you know, it was, it was like at a church in Chinatown. It was cramped. It was terrible. And, you know, everyone just holding up their, you know, hey, five, eight, five, eight. <laughs> you know, That was my first one. Yeah. You know, I sold like one pair of shoes. And I was like, all right, you know what? Those guys at J Nike, Jordan heads, you know, they're not into it. They're into Nike and Jordan. Like, that's their thing. I get it. Mm -hmm. But I figured, all right, you know, this one was the table was like 100 bucks. It was at Gillette Stadium. I figured, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll give it a shot. You know, I'll show the new stuff. I think 95% of people literally walked by my table without looking. They were like, you know, a 12-year-old a kid on one side and a <laughs> and an eight-year-old kid on the other asking yeah. 600 bucks for whatever they had that were used, you know? And they had tons of people. Nobody's looking at my stuff. Mm. And, you know, that was that was kind of tough, man. I mean, I like I like all for I like all sneakers more mostly. I mean, at least you can appreciate right. uh, you know, other brands. You know, these guys I have one eight year old kid come up to me, he's like, What a, what is that, like your own designs or something? <laughs> like, yeah, they're my own designs, I own the company. He goes He goes <laughs> You sell any shoes today? I go. Actually, no, I didn't. He goes. I wouldn't wear those. I go. Fuck you. Then get out of here, kid. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> like eight years old. His mom dropped them off. <laughs> Damn it. You know. But, but don't you think? Don't you think this is where? You have to tell your story, your brand story, and and, and align yourself differently because yes. that eight year old is not looking at heyday footwear. He's looking at yeah. Nike, Jordan, uh, even let's call it maybe even some New Balance occasionally, but really a Nike Jordan type kid. Yes, absolutely. You're and going after a different clientele. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's right. And one of the keys of a good strategy in, in, in business is not to go after everybody, to find a niche or several and then hit that hard and own that. And I've done very well in the in the dance community. Um, you know, I have also now breaking into the fitness world. I sponsor a lot of uh, competitive bodybuilders. I'll show you a couple others. I mean, you got to remember, as much as I might like my business to be gigantic, it's not. And, and you, you know, you have to find who likes your product and, and Absolutely. go after those people. So here's, here's one of my female athletes. She's an NPC physique competitor. I don't know if you can yep. catch the abs on her. All right, so she's wearing, wearing a pair there. And then um, uh, well, I got one more guy who's a, a pro, a couple of pro bodybuilders that wear the shoes, and you know they're into it, and I'm sort of break break into that market. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm looking for other markets too. But you know the traditional sneakerhead, it's not one of them. Um, I don't know why, but it's not. You know, it's sort of depressing because I obviously I've kind of been in the business a long, long time. I mean, you know, back to my sneaker play days. You know, um, but that's not that's not where the business is, and you have to kind of adjust things. And I've had to adjust 
business strategy uh, numerous times already, you know, from selling to, to boutiques to selling to major department stores to selling to shitty urban boutique, you know, stores to selling. I've had distributors all over the world um, selling on Amazon, Finish Line. You know, those are all different strategies. What happens to, to, your, to your boutiques that want exclusive when, the same, when your brand is selling at Finish Line? That kind of trashes that, at least mm -hmm. as far as salespeople are considered. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, you know, I've had to change things. And the last couple of years, really since I went uh, selling direct and you know, basically being on my own, is the fact that Heyday is limited. I mean, I make a couple hundred pairs or a hundred pairs of each one. And you know, people see, oh, out of stock, out of stock, you know, sizes six, seven, eight, nine, unavailable. Every day, you know, are you going to restock that? Are you going to restock that? And I have, you know, under buried in, in the copy, uh, under style availability, no, we make uh, a limited production. We generally don't restock or remake, mm -hmm. instead preferring to, to make new products. Um, originally, that, you know, that's because financially. Like, I don't have the money to, I came out with so many designs initially that I don't have the money to, to have 20 designs at minimums that I have to make at the factory in stock and still come out with new stuff. Like, it's just not there. I don't have the, the sales or the, or the money to support that. So I make a couple of styles, they sell. When I have the money from those sales, I then place a new order with the factory. Um, but the interesting thing is I've been thinking for a couple of months now that, you know, okay, we sell direct, so you can't buy it in stores. So my distribution is totally clean. Like, you can only get it from Hate Hate. Um, I, you know, I'm the chief everything officer. That's, like, literally my title, chief everything officer, CEO. And so that means I do everything. And people call up, you know, ask money, ask a question about their order or a size, and, you know, you know, hope I could help you with that. By the way, my name's Darren. I'm the owner. Yo, you're the owner? You're the designer? You're the one on all those YouTube videos? Yep, that's me. Oh my god, I can't believe I'm talking to you. So, to be able to connect with the customer, I mean, like, you know, are any of you guys planning on calling Nike for a question and Mark Parker is going to call you back? <laughs> Tinker Hatfield, you know, waiting to call you at 10 o'clock at night to answer your question about... <laughs> no, but you do get that service from, from me. Mm. Um, and that's part, like... That's part of my business model, is providing like crazy customer service. I'll do just about anything I can to make sure that you're happy. I, I, I talk on the phone, tell people. I had the same conversations with, with customers on the phone that I'm having with you guys. Right. I'm pretty transparent about stuff. Um, you know, people respect what I've what I've gone through. I mean, this has not been easy. You know. So Darren, I'm gonna. Hold this one. Hold that thought one second. I'm gonna. Uh, he's he's been sitting in the cut, very patiently waiting. Hit me, Mr. Dwayne Edwards. Hearing what you've heard, Darren share thus far. What are some of the What are some of the barriers or some of the things that popped up in your mind as you listened to Darren tell his story, but more recently? You know what he's doing with selling directly to his customers and answering the, you know, answering their questions directly and being Mr. CEO, Chief Everything Officer. Mm -hmm. um, as a as a fellow Chief Everything Officer and then some, um, you, you know what it's it's tough, man. You know, like like Darren is saying, you know, it's it's really difficult to have your own company of any kind, let alone when you try to. We try to get after a market that's so massive and then dominated by a few brands. You really have to look for, you know, similar to what you were saying, Darren. You have to look for what is your competitive advantage. And you know, it, at the when you're when you're a young entrepreneur, it's you. You know, it's it's gonna be you, and you have to decide, you know, where you want to be and who you want to be. Because you, you, you're never going to be Nike, you're never going to be Adidas, you're never going to be Jordan, you're never going to be any of those people. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I don't think you want to because, you know, with all that, you know, Biggie was right, more money, more problems. <laughs> and trust me, there's a lot of problems. Um, 
<laughs> but I think for you, you know, where with the stage with your, that you're in is you, you have to kind of sell who you are in your journey. You have to tell your story. Where I see most young brands where they don't do well is they don't story tell. They don't tell who they are. They don't tell their story. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the big brands, yes, they have billion-dollar advertising budgets and campaigns, and all they do is tell stories. They may be bullshit and made up, but they tell stories mm. on some level. <laughs> and, you know, I was actually just in China with uh, Android Home. Um, his name is Javier, who owns Android. And I was telling him the same thing. I was like, bro, you know, we have – Javier and I have very similar stories. We both come from – He's from um, NorCal, Northern California, I'm from Southern Cal. And people told him, don't even do it, dude. Like, don't even bother getting to the sneaker business. Don't even, don't even waste your money. He knew nothing about it, and he was like, I got to try it. Mm. And he, was, he persevered, and he tried it, and he's having some success. The difference, though, is same situation. He doesn't have a big advertising budget, a big marketing budget. He has a story, though, and he has a story that will connect and resonate with several people, it's just he's never told it. He's never told it. Okay. Never. Huh. He's never told it. And I was like, dude, you need to make yourself human. Um, all the brands that are named after people, you follow them a lot longer than you do brands named after companies. So yeah. you have you have the, those brands that are people like Gucci, Prada, Ferrari, Lamborghini. Those Adidas. are people. Adidas. Those are people. Those brands have a certain design language, a certain design <laughs> that they have that has carried them through from the beginning to now. Mm -hmm. And if you're an individual, you know, if you're a sole proprietor like yourself, dude, you, you got to tell your story. You got to paint what your story is because you're never going to be able to mark out market anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it as a as a negative. It's just I don't think you should. You should be smarter. You should yeah, I don't, I'm tired of working harder. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, you know it's it's uh it's it's you know I, I like I like quotes. You know, John, uh, D and Sean tell you that. One one of my favorite ones from John Wooden is, "Success is when uh, preparation meets opportunity." Mm -hmm. and, uh, one on my wall. Yep. Go 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 a little bit more. Let's see it. I see it. D H. Yep. Hey. <laughs> Hang on. The most beautiful curve is a rising sales graph. <laughs> <laughs> By Raymond Lowy, father of industrial design. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh that's not bad. That's, Bella wasn't bad either though. Shit. <laughs> um but uh yeah, it's it's dude, you just gotta keep persevering, dude. If 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 that's not your business you know, if, the, if that sneaker convention isn't your business, and I, I love I love the little story about Dish and Riley, little eight year old kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's tough, dude. I, I feel, you know, I feel I, your pain. I, 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 it, it was definitely frustrating hearing that from that little shit. But <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Um, I certainly, ha like I said, I, I got no money for anything. You know how many celebrities? wear my shoes, not because anybody's paid anything. Right. Nobody's paid anything. They wear it because they love the shoes, because I have built personal relationships with them, and because right. they can't get the shoes anywhere else. I mean, I have a, you know, over the years, I have personal relationships with a lot of people. Uh, right. You know, some some that you may think of sneakerheads, and some not. You know, Jay Sean, I've worked with the last four years, I've done some some one-offs for him. He's warm heydays in all his videos. Uh, I'm good friends with Lavar Burton from 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 Star Trek. Lavar really? wears heydays all the time. I only know Lavar from Roots. So. I was to say, <laughs> or, or, or reading Rainbow, exactly. Reading Rainbow. I, was about to say. I never watched Star Trek. I only know him from getting beat up with James. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I I've had shoes on on pretty much everybody. Uh, I certainly know all the stylists. Um, yeah, but you know, but you know, honestly, do a lot of people do that, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that as a as a negative. One one of the one of the bits of advice I would give you from designer to designer mm -hmm. is if you treat business like design, because at the root of who you are is a problem solver. Yeah. 
<laughs> part of your title, a part of your definition is you're a problem solver as a designer. Money is a problem. Solve it. Distribution is a problem. Solve it. Yep. Exposure is a problem. Solve it. So if, if you approach business the same way you go about approaching a technical design, for instance, you're solving problems. With, with what I do in my business, I don't call myself an entrepreneur. I'm still a designer because I'm solving problems. It's just my problems are business problems. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and one I, thing you I, can I, never I, take away from me is you never outwork me, and you'll never outthink me. Yeah, I mean, I, my time... Tunes, but it ain't going to happen. I spend <laughs> literally 5% of my time is spent actually designing shoes these days, but the rest of the time... <laughs> I'm using the design process and, and creative problem solving to deal with all the other issues that come up in, in being an entrepreneur and running a business. And you know, you need to be able to think that way. I think in order to succeed, uh, or at least hang in there. Um, I was going to say, you know, I, when I was packing up my stuff at uh, Sneaker Social, I had already run some boxes down to my van. When I came back up. There was a, a little like lookbook on one of my boxes uh, from Johnny Cupcakes. You know Johnny Cupcakes, the T-shirt guy. Uh, he was uh, like a speaker there, um, and you know had a booth. And you know I know I, I I've never met him, but you know I certainly know of him. And I said so. It's like that fucker, man. He's doing fantastic with a T-shirt with cupcakes on it. You know, that's his claim to fame. But I read through this lookbook, and I have it actually upstairs. I think, and all of the, all of my story that I tell, let's say on videos or however, but has been more or less buried within pages on my website, he, he told his story, and it's exactly my story, and the way he told it was just brilliant, and I'm paraphrasing parts of his story or using it to inspire me to, to how to retell that story front and center that you know what y you think you know Yeezys were exclusive at 2,000 pairs how about a hundred pairs that's exclusive um, you know you want premium materials we got them. Uh, you know you yeah, want yeah, wait 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 that's not that's not your story that's your product no. story that's not your story that is my story no, no, no. no. That's, part, that's part of the story. No, 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 no. You can't win that game. Yeah. You cannot win that game. You when, cannot win a product his story. When sell out, he doesn't make them again. We do the same thing. No, nah, but, but what, but what, but what, what, what Dwayne is saying point. is you have to, what Dwayne is saying is you have to tell that story in a way that endears the customer to it. It's not just uh, just a checkbox list of, of, of materials and exclusivity. It's it's saying what you're saying about those products, what you're saying about those materials and those things, but you have to tell it in a way that's that's compelling to your audience because nobody can doubt what you're saying. You know, the exclusivity, premium materials, that's fine, but those are all just check marks off of a product list. I, I could name you a hundred brands that have the exact same thing you just said. The I, exact I think same it's the thing. way that it's presented. Yeah, well, I got a bit of advice for you too, and, and I actually just I, I, I've heard this a long time ago, and I, I forget it. And often people forget it. Your website is not for you. Your website is not for you. Okay. It's, it's not for customer. You. It's for the customer, the end user. Yeah, it's for you. It's not for you. But we often build our websites for ourselves. Mm. Absolutely. And, 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 de and designers often design for other designers, which is another mistake. Correct. <laughs> so sometimes we make such simple, such simple fatal flaws from the very beginning, we just never recover from them. Mm. We just keep masking and masking and masking instead of actually really stepping so, back. So how do, think, you, you, know how do you remind yourself it. then? So how do you remind yourself of just that? How to design no, and, and not I'm, worry about the next person? Like confidence, right? It's like someone well, being confident in their abilities, their, their skill. It's not just that. The it's not something that you should ever have to remind yourself. It's it's job number one. That's yeah. all that matters. 
That's all mm -hmm. that matters. If you're if you're not doing that to solve, like like D says, if you're not doing that to solve a problem, if as a designer or a business person you are not looking at your end result in a strategic way, yep. then it's art. It's art for art's sake, and you might as well hang it on a wall and have it be precious, like a fine artist. Because then it's open to interpretation. This is about it's a step by step process, and your customer, your you know, like you said, your website. The information you put out there, the story that you tell, this thing can be so precious to you, but it's not going to make a damn bit of difference in your own hand. That is job number one: is to convey that message and give it to the customer. Everything you do is for them. The most important thing you can do is have the customer sell for you. Most definitely. Once, well, once they're convinced, once they're convinced of the product, mm. and we all do it all the time. I know I do it. I mean, we do it from what we eat to what we wear. Think about it. As soon as you try a meal at a restaurant, you want to go tell all your friends, yo. Yeah, absolutely. Word of mouth marketing. And the thing is, that's, that's the most important thing is to sell that story to the customer so the customer can tell that story to everyone else. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, I got a couple questions from online. Shout out to uh, Jay Scroggins. Mm. This question was uh, for Darren. Um, have you thought about coming out with a few more simplified and toned down designs? Um, I I have had some. Uh, they haven't sold as well. And mm. what I've found is is I you really you really need to well it, it works both ways. If you have too broad a line. You're giving the customer too many decisions to make, and then you're also spending a lot of money on a lot of product. So you have to narrow it down, but you can't narrow it down too much that you're then not expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, expanding your customer base or having something new. So at the moment, I am down to four new styles because I had to go to a new factory, and uh, Dwayne, I'm at a factory run by a former Stella Simona guy, so. He knows what he's doing, but I had to go to all new um, upper molds, and he's using uh, steel from Sweden that Stella uses, right. and you know, eleven sizes. I got my I got my outsole molds, but out of the seven or eight upper designs that I had, I, I don't have the money to you know spend two grand on upper tooling across seven or eight new styles. So I had to you know basically get out of there with the skin of my teeth mm. and reproduce the the one. The one style that I know is sold the best for me, and then when I can get things going again, I'll reintroduce new styles. Probably not go back necessarily to some of my older ones, but I mean this is a, you know, a pretty, a basic, you know, a basic black, um, and doing quite well with it. Right. I mean my, you know, my most successful ones were always the the exotic, the pythons. You know, I did them in probably 15 different colors, um, and those were always the most expensive. Because people really want to stand out. Um, I mean, I've got plain <coughs> canvas over here. I've got solid color stuff. Uh, it's just not my customer really wants to stand out, um, and that that's what I try to give to them. I mean, obviously, some stuff is is more wearable than others. This was just not wearable, um, you know. But I think this pretty wearable, and certainly a colorway that you know has worked in the past for other brands. And and for for my brand, it's uh, you know, it, it's it's a new it's a new color palette with a with with a built-in uh, eight hundred thousand strong audience um, of very rabid. Uh, fashion conscious fit models and, and fitness trainers and I'm going after you know that particular market not just with those shoes but you know I have found success in certain markets and that's you know that is where I, I do try to uh, focus a lot of my time and energy I've got a lot of Zumba instructors that wear the shoes uh, so that's you know that's another market to explore um, you know, because uh, you know, what, what sometimes I feel like I'm the most successful, unsuccessful entrepreneur. 
Mm -hmm. I had so many. I've done TV commercials for Moo. I've got all these celebrities wearing the shoes. I've done pretty big interviews and, and, and presentations at design conferences. I mean, I'm out there from a public relations standpoint. This, you know, and the company may look big from the outside. Obviously, it's gone down in size, partly because of the business model and you know problems with factories and whatever. But um, you know, I, I've certainly increased my the amount of freelance work that I do. Um, people don't necessarily know what my you know, volume is of, of Heyday Footwear, but they see what I'm doing and doing it single-handedly. And you know, thank God I have you know I have a, a, a pretty strong palette or, or backload of, of design work from all sorts of different Yay. companies, which you know helps to keep Yay. it going. Yeah, you, you know, let me can I can I give you some advice, Darren? Sure, sure, Dwayne. One of the things I'm 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 hearing, um, and I'm not sure if you're hearing it though, is that I haven't really been able to identify who your one customer on earth. If if you didn't sell shoes to anybody else but one person on earth, who that person would be? Um, so what I and the reason why I say that is, you should you should consider that pleasing that one person and letting others elevate to where you are. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing you say, though, is you're kind of grasping at business whenever it comes to you. And when you do that, I can understand there's a revenue component associated with it because we all got to eat and live. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, one of the things I'm also hearing, too, is that it seems like you, you're you pulling yourself in so many different directions that your brand actually does not have a true identity. Mm -hmm from a consumer point of view and because it doesn't have a true consumer identity it's going to be difficult for people to embrace who you are because they're not sure who you are okay but, but I understand the, the the dollars and cents of it you know a great poet out in Compton DJ quick you said if it doesn't make dollars it don't make sense I get it <laughs> I totally get it. but um, but you know, as a as a business owner, at some point, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to step back and say, "Hey, you know what? Maybe just because there was some good money over here, maybe that's not what I want my brand to stand for." And you might have to say no to certain money to get your brand on a certain track to go right. in a certain direction. Hmm. Um, where I've had to make several of those decisions in a short period of time. I've been out on my own. And that's a couple of the reasons why I left Jordan, is they were making some decisions that weren't going to be good for their long-term future. But they did it because they're a public company. Mm -hmm. Nike's a public company. So you have to answer to other people besides yourself. So I get that. Mm -hmm. But if you're a business owner, you, you, have the, you have the ability to control your own destiny. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start to chase, you will always chase. Always chase. And for me, it seems like you're chasing a, chasing a few different industries here and there where, you know, you think you should identify who you want to be and where you want to go and put that designer problem software hat on and figure out how am I going to get there. Now, you might have to say no to stuff to get to that point, but you're going to have to say no to some stuff um, in order to get your brand aligned in the direction you, you really want it to go in. Um, I got one question, objectively speaking, also, um, Darren, because you guys just addressed the other one with the comments Dwayne just made about, um, you know, being chased, chasing, you know, dollars all over the place. He kind of answered that one, um, when he addressed the advice to you. Mm -hmm. Um, this is objective, no shots here. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about changing the name of your company? No. The only reason why I say that is because to most people, on the surface, your name means past success. Mm -hmm. it, it means the most successful period of of your life or or vigor. I don't know that people are are delving that deep into it to associate uh, past. Um, I mean, no, I would not. I would not change the name of the company. Okay. I mean, it's. 
there, there, there is equity built up in that company, and there's costs involved. Uh, I, I don't think that changing, I don't think that changing, to change the name would mean you know I would start over with mm. with a new concept and a new a new brand. Uh, mm. But I don't think you. I don't. Th I don't think. I don't think that I would start over with or, or restart the brand with a new name. I would start something new. Have you have you thought about uh, uh, segmentation diversification? So, you know, all brands do it where they have a, another sub brand, um, where you know, for you, HD or something, something that's more abbreviated. It's been out there, yeah. Um, because I, I I actually personally agree with with Sean in the sense of names are very very important to people, extremely important to people. Um, and at the same time, it's also important to you as a brand owner as well, where you you may have a certain feeling towards it because it may mean a certain thing to you, but then you have to spend the money to educate people on what that means. I haven't been to your website. Check it out. But I wonder, is the definition of your brand name on the first page? Uh, yeah. It's on a uh, rotating text up at the top. So it tells you, it gives you a slogan of what, what you're trying to accomplish with the, the name the name of it. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. But I, I would I would think about a sub brand, you know, from uh, just an abbreviation. Uh, one, one suggestion one suggestion that may help. Uh, one suggestion that may help is just I, what you said about heyday being the most successful period of your life. That's compelling. I think it's not hype; it's heyday. It, life. I think that would accomplish both a tagline for you and what Dwayne is saying in having an upfront, immediate uh, definition of the name. Because what you just said is far more compelling than battling the hype. You know, you're already battling the hype because they're exclusive, they're small batch. Um, you know, the, the materials are, are, are of better quality. Um, I like what you said about this yeah. being the, it was a perfect explanation or answer to what Paper was saying. So yep. I, I think something like that would be very compelling because it would explain your name right away, and it's the definition. Okay. Yep. You got to lead with it, man. You got right. You got to lead with it. Um, sometimes we can be so close to things that we, we f again we forget about the simplest things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially you know when you work when you work for a corporation or a bigger brand, and you know you you have uh, you know you have other designers, you have other coworkers around you. You know, you, a lot of designers you know go to the other end of the design studio or to another department and you know run stuff by other people, um, get feedback. You know, working. For yourself, basically, you don't necessarily have that anymore. You lose that that interaction. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. Yes and no, man. I I, I disagree. I, I would tend to disagree only because um, this is something I tell my students all the time: is you need to surround yourself with people that are better than you, because that's the only way you're gonna get better. And you do that through creating creative circles. A creative circle of people that have more knowledge than you, and they can, that you can go to, and they'll give you their honest opinion. Not your friends, mm -hmm. not your family, because they're gonna lie to you. They're gonna lie to you just to be nice to you. That's why. Mm -hmm. So when you when you have people that you, and I'm I'm sure you 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 explained you you've worked at several places, so you know people. I do. And there's nothing wrong with you picking up. The phone and establishing a in the in the business term is called a board of advisors. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with you creating a board of advisors of trusted creatives that you, you know that you value their opinion and you can call on for simple things. Where um, that's why I say I disagree because you do have those people in your life you just haven't exercised it. That's the, that's why I say I disagree. Mm -hmm. um, where what ends up happening as an entrepreneur, and believe me, I'm I'm with you, dude. We 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 do everything. We eat, sleep it. We dream about it. We do everything, and we try to solve all the problems on our own. 
Mm-hmm. And you can't. As soon as you can, you know, be honest enough with yourself to admit it, you can't. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That's when you start to get on your your creative your creative uh, juices going like, who do I know who knows this better than me? Mm-hmm. Who, who do I know who knows this person? Who do I know who does that? And this industry is tiny. It's extremely tiny. Right. I've never seen you before until tonight, but I'm sure we know the same people. I'm confident we know the same people. And simply when you said Stella, somehow you know I knew Stella. <laughs> so that's how small this industry is where you need to utilize your resources that you have around you because you can't build this by yourself. You're going to have to get some help. And, and when I'm saying help, it's just advice. It's just stuff that you would hope that people would call on you to do one day. Um, so, you know, don't don't uh, don't feel like you have to do it all, all on your own or, you know, say that you don't have any help. Um, I know one of, one of my bigger strategic advantages of, of doing what I'm doing now, and, and when I talk to different entrepreneurs too, one of the first things I hear them often say is, how can I get money? Where do I get money? Money is always like within the first five minutes of every entrepreneur's conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's a flaw. That's a critical flaw because there's something more valuable than money, and it's association. Mm-hmm. You can be associated with a company or a person or some kind of a collaboration that you couldn't buy. Mm. Which Darren has had some of those successes too. With yes, with but what happens with mm-hmm. entrepreneurs? They're so money is such a topic that's on their head that they forget about association, which equals money. Mm-hmm. But you're so focused on the money part, you completely miss the association which could translate to a whole lot more money than what you think you need. And I, I see that often where you, you kind of overlook the association. This industry is tiny, man. I'm sure there's people you can, you can connect with that can help elevate your brand, whether it's a factory, whether it's a relationship, or whatever, whatever that is. You just got to put that thinking cap on, man, and, and put the money part aside. How can I elevate this brand with no money? That that's that's what you should write down. It's like how can I do that? I, I think I do that because I have no money, and I, <laughs> I, I, my my networking skills are are pretty top notch. I'm, I'm I'm only saying that because in the hour in the half roughly I've been listening to you, I heard you say money about fifty times. It it is something <laughs> that is there, but. I know it's there. Uh, having, I know it's there. Not having had any investors, I've had people interested. I'm, you know, I've never taken any money. I don't want money. I don't want to lose control of mm-hmm. what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, there's times where you know it, it would be nice to to have some money, but while things are not w- exactly where I would want them to be completely, uh, I do feel like I've done. I've done well for myself. I mean, you know, sure. There's a lot of people that don't that don't know me in uh, the sneaker world. That there's a lot of people that, um, you know, people are. I might have been more well known a few years ago when I was selling wholesale, and I would be in Vegas, and obviously do a lot of networking in Vegas. Um, but you know, my 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 Rolodex is is pretty full and active, um, LinkedIn, all over, all my social media. Yeah, uh, but you can have all that. You can have all that, but if you don't utilize it the right way, what's the point of having it? Honestly, like, what's the point of having it? If you're not here's, using it. Here's, here's an example. Like, Dan, you might not know that we talked before. I remember you giving me a call to ask how big Ridiculous was because what I was doing seemed like I had more on my team, mm-hmm. and I don't. It's just me, you know. But I may not still be in that Rolodex, but I'm an award-winning designer. I'd be more than happy to help you with, with like like D said, like DE said, marketing ideas, you know, tagline ideas, you know, thoughts on on where to go. You know, I'd I'd love to be a part of a a a board 
that that helps you get there that's just an email or a phone call away. I think that's what D is talking about is not so much the grand reach. Not not the not the not the big the big money names and that sort of thing. It's just those those trusted folks that you that you can call on, you know, yeah. with Dwayne. I I drop Dwayne an email if I need it, if I if I have a problem or even for no reason at all. Last week I dropped him an email because we happen to know a person in common, and I yeah. just wanted to make the link. I wanted to make the connection that we had this person in common and say hello to both of them at the same time. Yep. And and it's it's always been a circle. I mean, we call D E. D E calls us. We call you. Tariq calls us. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of everybody that I see here, and yeah. we all do it. Yeah. We're all doing it because we know that there's a certain level of objectivity we don't have mm -hmm. that has to come from the people who we trust who are not going to patronize us and people who are on a grind who are going to they're going to sink their teeth into what it, what exactly it is you put on the plate in front of them. Um, and it's healthy. It's very healthy. Um, for, for a long time, I'll give an example, Darren. Uh, our logo was worldwide recognized. People know the OSD logo, but people hate the OSD logo. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Dwayne is one of them, right at the top of the list. Hates mm -hmm. the logo. But we were like, okay, it's going to grow on people because they hate it. But we also knew deep down we that we were going to reach that crossroads exactly. where we were going to have to change it. Why we people hate it? For the right time. I've never heard nobody say they hate it. Why, why do people Lots hate it? people hate that logo. Make no mistake oh, about yeah. it. Yeah. We could talk, we could talk other times, uh, Heat, about that. About Make why. no mistake yeah. about it. But, yeah. but, you know, again, the example that um, DE and, 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 and Steve were putting before us just that we were talking about is to have that, that cabinet, if you will, for lack of a better description, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have that cabinet. Hey, it, it helps, man. Like, as far as me, and as far as me in the circle of everybody, like, I sent Sean and D my edits before, you know, before I, I put it on my Vimeo, before I unlock it. D goes through it with a fine tube comb, and, you know, he'll let me know if something ain't right. You know what I'm saying? So, it helps. Well, I, I would, I'd it. love to be able to reach out to you guys. You know, I'm, I'm happy to... Yeah, that's why we're here tonight. Do, do you happy to do 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 do. mind and and you know, I'd be happy to talk with you guys and and, and also, I mean, I'd be happy to to obviously provide whatever input I can to you guys. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's always free. That'll work for us all. I've, I've done tons. Has it all been successful? No, but I, you know, running this business, I know literally every aspect of of running a footwear brand. Mm -hmm. Um. Like everything. So one of the things that I always like to, br to bring up is, and, and many of you who know me and have been able to know me or learn how I operate, I would say good people ne need to know other good people. Because just like, you know, like Dwayne said earlier, is you want to surround yourself with other people that know more than you. But also at the same time, you can say, well, with what I know and what you know, we can all win together. And that may sound cliche, yes. Someone would say, damn, come on, that's some like business school or some like kumbaya stuff. But the reality is if I trust if I trust you to to look at my business, maybe my business plan, my designs, or maybe even just a letter and say, What do you think? I take your word at it and I'm gonna help you the next time around with whatever I can. And like like you know, we always say that and, and, and Dwayne is always good at saying there's no one that's gonna outwork him. And I truly do believe it because you know what? My nine, my soon to be ninety four year old grandma used to always tell me, she's like, Listen, you always are gonna be tired. The day you can sleep is the day you die. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so until then, work. I mean that that and this is a woman you know, coming from a woman with a third grade education that raised two kids and you know, worked until she was in her sixties and just hustled. I mean so we take what we know. You take the, the, the women, the men here, and the other people outside who aren't able to be on the show tonight as we celebrate episode 300 and be able to say, okay, let's, let's figure out how to help kind of bring this all together and help, you know, help be a pencil, help Heyday Footwear, help, you know, uh, One Sneaker Nation, help uh, Video Studios, help OSD, help all these other 
because all of us have all these different skills. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing we always do, we know this, is we talk ourselves out of stuff. You all the time. All the time. And, and, that was one of, and that was one of the biggest things that, you know, why I even had to separate myself from, you know, from Soul Collector and from other stuff. I mean, even this show, you know, for the longest time, this show was, was only supposedly supposed to last six episodes, someone told me. After six episodes, someone told me, you are not, you're going to run out of content. And I, say, <laughs> and I said, you are absolutely wrong. And here we are. Six and a half years almost, later. Almost, yeah, exactly. And we're, we're only off by 294. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I want to go back to something that, that, that you said, Darren. Hmm. And I totally understand exactly what you said when you said it. You feel like sometimes you're the most successful, unsuccessful person. Hmm. And coming from somebody who, you know, I, I've never had anything. I've always wanted things, and I've always wanted to surround myself with. with and I've, I've made the, the the point on here, you know, mm -hmm. I got to get better friends because you know I got a lot of, especially where I grew up at, I got a lot of friends that ain't shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> no, bro, you know, we all and, got. And the thing is, I, I you know I, I've said it before, and I've, I've made a lot of people angry on here because I always say, you know, I'm not shit, and I I, tr I strive to be better than I am. I say all that to say. I feel exactly what you felt for the most of my adult life. I've always wanted to have, I've always wanted to do, and I've always, you know, D and Pape and, you know, a couple people on here know I've tried to start my own thing, and I try to do everything by myself. Mm -hmm. And it is extremely difficult to do it by yourself. And I think at the end of the day, I think D, um, I think everybody on here is just basically trying to tell you you know, you can try to do it by yourself, and you've gotten, uh, gotten, you know, a lot further than I've ever had, and a lot, a lot further than most people will by themselves. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you need to surround yourself with a team, because if you don't, then you know, it, you can only do but so much. You know what I'm saying? I think that that's really the main thing that they're trying to say, and it's it's what I had to learn. You know, like I I, I was doing everything by myself, and it. I just became overwhelmed to the point where I was just like, you know what, I, I just, I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And then when I did get to the end of the tunnel, it ended up being a train. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's the light that I saw. You know what I mean? And, and so, you know, once I realized, okay, I have to develop a team, I have to get a, a, a circle around me to help me, then I feel so much better about the direction that I'm going. I'm not, I'm not anywhere yet, but... I'm 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 moving and I'm moving in a positive direction and I see myself being way more successful this time around because I've tried to do it by myself not once but twice and and it I didn't I didn't get anywhere where I wanted to be so now now with a team you know what I'm saying with with two other brothers with me and and this you know what I'm saying the cats on this show you know what I'm saying behind me you know, and other people, you know, really just trying to build that support system, then, you know, I, I definitely see this out, this coming out being a lot better, this outcome. You know what I mean? So that's all. I think that's all everybody's saying, man. I don't think, I think everything here is love. Everything is here is positive. But, you know, sometimes you got to be able to be honest with yourself and let others be honest with you and, and give you and give you the real. You know what I mean? And that's the main reason I love this show is because, you know, I can be myself and I'm, you know, I ain't really about, about beating the bush and all, all that bullshit and trying to be nice and I ain't really that type of dude. You know, I'm straightforward to the point and that's what I need. You know, I need somebody who's gonna be, yo, that ain't shit, Leo. Like you fucking up. I'm like okay, you know what I'm saying? I, 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 that's what I respond to. You know what I'm saying? When I hear that, I'm like, okay, I gotta get back right. You know what I mean? So everybody needs that tough love and I think that's all it is, man. Hey, I appreciate all the comments and all the input. And even just all the, the the people that are just you know listening. I mean, I I really do appreciate that someone's even interested in hearing what I have to say. Um, Absolutely. You um, know, my uh, my story is you know is full of ups and downs. But you know what? Uh, I'm still I'm happy, man. I, my my wife supports me. My 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 six year old son keeps. Doing his little renderings and he's telling me to send it to my developer in China. And he, uh, there we go. Do it right. 
He says, make no, sure no. make sure Ian in China does this right this time. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I got two kids. I'm I'm home. Uh, work. My office is in my house. I'm there for pick up, drop off, sick days. I'm there for my kids. I'm working all the time. Uh, I like being on my own schedule. Um, I was never great at working for other people. Um, so, you know, I, I am not in a terrible place. I mean, I've been at this seven years now. I'm not, you know, it's not a startup, you know, for a year. And, that you know, I'm still pushing. I still have a million things on my checklist uh, mm -hmm. of, of angles to hit. But, I'm, you know, I'm pursuing more and more freelance work. I'm thinking of other stuff that I might want to do. Um, but it's all been good. I mean, I don't regret any of it. I, the amount that I learned in the last seven years is is absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah. You know absolutely. how well, how, I'm gonna, how I'm going to how I'm going to and 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 use that next. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but you know, I I was able to to go out on my own and and succeed where other people. You know, gave up. I mean, that's not me. I, I don't stop. Um, and maybe there's times I should have stopped, uh, or obviously made decisions that you know were the wrong ones. But you know, you, you have to live with it and, and move on. Um, you know, there were people I hired that I, I should have let go much earlier. Mm -hmm. um, there were there were you know things that business decisions that I should have made. I mean, I, I should have. <coughs> You know, whatever. I mean, there's a million things. There's also a million fantastic things that that I've done. Um, and you know, you have to, sometimes you have to look at what the happiness quotient <laughs> with your life. And I'm pretty good, man. You know. And, and we want you to continue to get even better. Know that. I mean, like I said, you know, D and I have known you for quite some time. Um, you're up there in D's region, so he sees you more often than I do. But you know the interesting thing also on the outside looking in, in our six and a half years of doing this show and all of the changes that have happened in the athletic footwear business, um, even the personal ones like, you know, what Dwayne has done, you know, Pencil, you know, didn't exist, you know, when we started. Mm -hmm. But now it's quietly becoming one of the most influential things in the entire footwear industry, you know, because he... he Refuse to be comfortable, you know. And I, I think, think I, I think I even uh, emailed Dwayne about uh, doing something with you guys here in Boston. You're doing a, a Boston uh, curriculum too, aren't you? Yeah, we do it at MIT. Uh, we do it for high school kids, black and brown high school kids. Yeah. So you know, there, there needs to remain in all of us, uh, you know, a level of never being comfortable with where we are. And wanting to finally get to a place of of, of comfort, mm -hmm. but never quite get there. That's going to keep us, you know, creative and innovative and solving problems and pushing. Yeah, it's um, also very zen, though. That's the the itch that cannot be scratched, which yeah. forces you to, to always look for something to, to to fill that you know that emptiness. But that's so. Yeah. so it's either, and I was gonna say yeah, it's either uh, it's either Zen or I'm I'm more of a Bruce Lee guy. Uh, <laughs> where one of, one of my favorite quotes from him is "To hell with circumstances, I create opportunities." Mm. Ain't yeah. nothing stopping me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so you know, one of the things that one of the one of the more stereotypical things that exist among consumers, sneaker lovers, everybody is it's easy to come out with your own sneaker and it's easy to, to come out with your own sneaker store. Those are, the two, those are the two things that D and I hear the most of. I'm not sure about anyone else, but the two things D and I hear the most of is it's easy to come out with your own sneaker and it's easy to open up your own sneaker store. And when we teach social studies, we actually have an assignment um, where we assign students what we say a relative left you half a million dollars and knowing that you were so heavily into sneakers and loved them so much they wanted you to start your own business 
but the conditions under which you receive this half a million dollars were you cannot open your own sneaker store and you cannot <laughs> create your own sneaker brand. And we forced them to come up with another option. People think it's easy, bro. People really think it's easy. You know, and that how about, comes uh, how about you got Dwayne, you know Tim Talley? Mm, you lace no. you lace, he was just on Shark Tank. No. You guys know you, you lace their uh, elastic single laces with Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah he was I, I met him probably three, four years ago. Uh, you know, I think he was like out of Albany or Buffalo or something and Buffalo, yeah. Buffalo. Really, really nice guy, very small. And um I think he got Mark Cuban. Uh, yeah, he did a licensing deal with Cuban. Uh, yeah, he was on Shark Tank about a month ago. I was like, holy shit, I know that guy. Right yeah. On. Yeah, yeah, he uh, he was doing distribution in Japan. He actually did it in the States for a little bit, didn't work. Then he went to Japan, and, and it started to work over there, and then uh, it, it, it didn't work. It still didn't work here, but Cuban saw it as a great opportunity to do a licensing play. Mm-hmm. Um, so he can get some of that, um, some of that NBA licensing money. So, yeah, I remember seeing that one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that you know, if you're in the footwear industry, you know, there's probably more people not in de- design positions that are still, you know, happily employed in the footwear industry. But was, you know, be a developer, be in marketing, be a fit tester. I mean, there's tons of jobs. Know. Tons of jobs. Yeah, there's tons of jobs. People that don't. You know, people. Are like, oh, how do I get into footwear design? Well, you know. Yes, that's not as easy as people think. No, <laughs> it's such a small industry. You have a better chance of dating Janet Jackson than being footwear designer. <laughs> 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 I'm a pretty good looking guy. Put that on the list. I'm write that shit down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, got me singing yeah. Janet Jackson songs now, man. When I think of you, <laughs> pleasure principle, baby. It's exactly. Pleasure principle. Yeah. Darren, yeah. What's the one parting statement you would make to someone listening to this show tonight who heard your stories, listened to your your journey, you know, heard our feedback and and, and everything in in response to it? What's the one thing you would leave them with? Um, well, I did this commercial for uh, for Moo.com, which is like a business card printer, where they basically I was I've used them for years, and they let you put different images on the back of every card, and I wound up meeting the uh, the CEO at at South by Southwest a number of years ago, and they wound up having me uh, actually uh, film their first uh, U.S. and U.K. TV commercial. And they pulled it from about two hours of interviews uh, that they did with me in a recording studio. And um, it was network, network, network. You never know when someone you meet somewhere can be important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, you know, I have my my business cards attached to my keychain. I've got my stickers in every pocket. Uh, I've always got my shoes. My Honda Odyssey is wrapped in Heyday logos. My license plate is Heyday. You know, I'm out there all the time, and I'm always happy to meet people. And I, I just love, I love networking. I, I love going into the Apple Store, or going into a restaurant where you get amazing customer service. And I just want to tell you, tell, I was like, can I speak to the manager? I'm like, your person gave me amazing customer service. It was so nice and refreshing to to deal with that person. And you know, how could I use that myself? Um, so I just like meeting people and having this circle. And you're right. There's I, I need to probably rely a bit more on it for uh, a constructive feedback and input on my own business, where I, I do look at it as as using that circle for connect. I love connecting other people, um, and like you said, I, I like just I like introducing two people who who should know each other. Um, it's such a great feeling. So I, it's it's really so much about who you know and, 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 and how do you know them and what can you offer and um, you know just be open to, to a lot of things. I mean uh, you know like Bruce Lee says you know you can bend, you know, bend like bamboo and be like water and mm-hmm. you know, there's lots of things that can happen and, and, and you know your business has to change 
uh, or your lifestyle has to change. And you know, another Zen saying for you is, wanting is not having, and having is not possessing. And you got to be prepared to let stuff go, and and change with it. Um, just because you want it doesn't mean it's happening. Just because you have it for a minute doesn't mean it's always going to be there. Um, and be cool with that. Um, that's good. So, you know, that's it. And, and um, you know, I, if I could figure out on this, this is my first time actually doing a Google Hangout, although I am on Google+. Plus. If I could figure out how to get the, all of you chat, uh, happily provide you with all my contact info or just get it off my site. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, um, I'll make sure everyone gets it. And, you know, I'd be happy to, to chat with any of you anytime. Uh, and not even about my stuff. You know, how how can I how can I help you with 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 a fresh perspective on on stuff you're doing, um, or connect you with somebody that I know that might be able to help you? Um, that's what we're all about, dude. You know, that, 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 that's, about. that's what I like to do. So that, that's one of the things that's a strength of what we've done all these years, and that we take pride in is the fact that from day one, when D had this harebrained idea on August 27, 2007, to turn on his mic and start ranting about different shit that was going on that year in sneakers. And it just explode into where it is right now and the things that we've um, ventured into and the people that we've met and the projects and such that we've worked on. Um, we knew what our rules were going to be once we moved down a certain path. We identified that we were not going to be like certain other sneaker websites and people who did certain things in the industry that we saw as sort of a crowded space. Mm -hmm. um, and we just looked through all these years to all the good people we've met and the people that have stayed involved with us. We've looked to where their involvement could help us evolve collectively, personally, and do something that was big and can contribute you know, in whatever way possible to this industry and this thing we love called sneakers. So, you know, that was our blueprint, and it's led us to some really incredible things and incredible people who we're thankful for. Um, like D said, you know, whoever told him we weren't supposed to go past four episodes or six episodes, where's that person now? Yeah. You know? Actually, I wonder. <laughs> you know, we, 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 I really you know, do. I, I get text messages and emails and Facebook comments and IG comments and stuff all the time. Why? How come you guys don't make these lists these guys make up? And how come you got? They don't put you guys here. How come they don't ask you guys this, that, and the third? It's like people know where we are. You know, people know exactly where to find us, and they've known where to find us for almost seven years. The time hasn't changed pretty much. Um, the venue and the platform we express ourselves on is pretty is changed, but I mean we're consistent in what OSD has been all about, and we've listened to the people in regards to you know certain aspects of what we do that we should never stray away from, mm -hmm. and we've also paid attention to the way certain mediums have changed and the way we should embrace technology in order to evolve in a good way, not appear to be trendy and not appear to just decide to ride a wave that seems to be having a good moment right now. We really just wanted to naturally evolve with and use technology to still be the same people but reach out in a way where it's comfortable for everybody, for us as a cast, as a company, for our audience. And it's just really just keeping your antennas up to everything, you know. D and I and Dwayne and Steve and Tariq and we're all always just throwing stuff back and forth at each other through whatever medium is convenient for us. Email, text message, Twitter, IG, Facebook, whatever. Mm -hmm. It hits us, we send it. And sometimes it sparks something crazy that, you know, becomes the next great idea. Other times it just sparks something where there's a difference of opinion, but it's healthy to just get it out there so that it becomes kind of the microcosm of what the macrocosm, which is your customer base out there, is going to think. So, you know, I'm happy for us to be where we are and even to be at this point where we can have this discussion with you tonight about your brand. Um, you're not going to get this on any other site. Your hype beast, your sneaker news, nice kicks, shoe game, whoever, whoever the site is, you would never have this opportunity to be in this position 
to to get some soul food, for lack of a better description. Oh, you know? I like that. <laughs> Put that in the book. You know, so you know, we we thank you for that, for coming on and being able to really open up yourself and be, because one of the other things that people like to see as an entrepreneur or owner of a brand or company is, you know, people expect you to show off. Like Ridiculous said, you know, when you reached out to him, you thought he had a million people rolling with him. Um, and it's just him because of the way he chose to maneuver and handle his business. But he knew that in order to move and give that impression, certain things had to be done the right way. And it's the same thing for us. It's the same thing for you. It's the same thing for Dwayne. It's the same thing for anybody who launches their own business but realizes that it does take a village to raise a child. It really does sometimes. So thank you for coming on, man. Being Thanks able. for having me, guys. Hopefully, uh, you know, I'll be there for the 600th. <laughs> That's why I'm going to be holding up my... my, my Sneaker people retirement card. <laughs> <laughs> Holding that shit up. <laughs> I'm hollering at Jason Maiden because I'm getting Air Monarchs for the rest of my days. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, there you go. There you go. That's all I'm going to wear once I reach 50. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Dara, we appreciate you being on and, and, and certainly coming back and you know, joining us once again here in 2014. Anytime. You know, and, and, you. and yeah. telling the story, and more importantly, sharing and putting it all out there because that's what we do. That's what we're about at OSD, and that's what you know this show is about. It's about the people, you know, why we love you know the footwear industry, but also things that make us really you know sometimes question and realize that there's a lot of resources right here, you know, within this particular show. So we appreciate you joining us tonight. And being our guest for episode 300, man, it's been awesome. 300. 300. 300. Um, man. Mr. D.E. Yeah. The the head pen in charge at Pencil. Uh. You got some 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 news for us? Anything coming up? You want to share with the disorderlies around the world? Man, you know, I always got a bunch of stuff going on, but <laughs> what in particular? <laughs> any, anything on WSC? Anything on any open enrollment for anything else coming up? Oh yeah, we gonna we we uh, we're gonna reschedule that. Um, so World Sneaker Championship is gonna be rescheduled from Parsons in New York to Portland. Um, so we'll we'll look at uh, reopening that up um, first part of uh, May, okay. first week of May. We'll open that back up. Got some good, some real good surprises in store for that one. Um, so I think I think people will be uh, pretty pretty excited about it when we release everything. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna tie it all up in a nice little bow and, and and release it all at the same time when we open up registration again. Nice. But nice. that that one's gonna. Now uh, we had quite a few uh, submissions for uh, what was the initial open open enrollment, right? Yeah, yeah, we had about three, three hundred fifty something people register for it. Um, I, w I would imagine when we re, when we reopen it with the new information that we're gonna launch, that number probably double or triple. Mm. So that that should be good. But it was a lot of talented kids, though. It was a lot. Um, a lot of them were disappointed that we rescheduled, but they they uh, they know they got a second chance, so they they're excited about coming to Portland as well. So that that should be good. Yeah, I think it's a better atmosphere too, considering it's home cooking for the school. So yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, Pencil is always a better experience in Portland, um, just because of I have my own facilities um, and I have access to to more more designers and, and former students, current students, and you know people I used to work with. Um, Jordan, Nike, come through. So it's, it, and, and the Adidas folks have been great as well. So it's always a different experience in Portland. Um, it's good to be, you know, in, in New York, and it's good to be in Boston, be in other people's uh, facilities, which is always good because you you get a different flavor, you get a different crowd. Um, so that part is is good as well, but it's, it's, it's nothing like being at home. Though. So, what is the current count on pencil alum that are out working at brands? Sixty-seven. 
Wow. Yeah, it's in three years, which is good. Um, 67 in three years. Yeah, which is good. I mean, I didn't even know, like, um, like I've been getting, like, all these congratulation notes on, on LinkedIn, and I'm like, congratulating me on what? So I had to, like, go <laughs> on there and find out what was going on. And uh, it was, uh, I guess it was when, when because uh, I left Jordan April 1st three years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. And, uh, and I guess that's the same day I changed over my LinkedIn profile from Jordan to uh, Penso. So people have been uh, congratulating on three years of Penso being, being, in, being in business. So, um, it, was good to, it was good to read some of the quotes. Like there's one guy I never even heard of before. Um, he was a guy, he, he's, he works at uh, North Face. And he was like, oh, you know, Pencil is great. Please keep with the good work. We have three of your students right here. Mm. <laughs> um, so it's like when you, when, you, when you read some of that kind of stuff, it's always good to at least you know you're going down the right path and you're doing the right things. And, and people are appreciating kind of what you're doing. Yep. And uh, we gotta gotta send a sh shout out and congratulations to one of your other Pencil alum, Mr. Alan Largen. Congrats on his new endeavor. Good stuff, homie. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I need to hit Alan up. That's right. Yeah. The the, yeah, the we got a couple. Uh, uh, well, we're probably some some few early future soul kids got placement, so that you know I let them I let them talk about that in a few months, but. Mm -hmm. It's good to see, you know, 15-year-olds, you know, six, seven years later, um, you know, come full circle and, and, and get the jobs that, you know, they were trying to get when they were 15. Mm-hmm. So yeah. That's going to be good to, for, the, for those guys to, when, when it does become official, official, and they can talk about it. Yeah. We, we got to do, do a show reunion. <laughs> <laughs> wow. If if VH1 can do a love and hip hop reunion, we could damn sure do a pencil reunion on this piece. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a pencil future soul reunion on this piece. Yeah, that'd be good actually. Yeah, and it won't be any fights. <laughs> 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 oh man! So well, before we get ready to go, because it's twelve sixteen Eastern Standard Time, um, give us a couple words on uh. On on, three hundred episodes for us and 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 you, we gotta thank you first and foremost for being such an inspiration for us to keep pushing, and we gotta thank you of course. Um, but 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 look at what has changed. What what has changed in six and a half years, three hundred episodes that you've seen? Yeah, you know, like you know. Uh, well, first, I mean, I mean, you know, you guys touched on it earlier about you know having having. You know, a forum for us to pick each other's brain and 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 uh, bounce and bounce off of each other. The same the same thing goes to you fellas too. You know, I appreciate you know the the emails and, and the quick responses and just the brotherhood. Quite honestly, that you know I've experienced with with you fellas and and even even the rest of some of the other brothers on the show as well. Um, you know what was interesting. I always go back to uh, D. I go back to when when I was in Jordan, and um, they didn't want me to be on the show. Yeah. <laughs> they, they they didn't want me to come on because like ah you know it's a little show you know nobody's gonna be listening you know you don't need to waste your time to do that. And you know that's we didn't know each other, but you know I don't roll like that. I don't I don't discriminate. I don't look at anybody less than. That's just now how I look at people. And so I, I did my own investigation, find out like, okay, who are you? And we wrapped in Seattle. I remember it was Nike Town, Seattle. We met for the first time, I believe. Um, I think it was a Soul Collector event, maybe. Well, it was like actually on campus when we first met. Okay, okay. Yeah. We, and then, yes, that's right. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, you know, I did it anyway, you know, without <laughs> Jordan. So uh, back then they didn't have, you know, as strict restrictions as they do now, but. Um, but you know, I'm glad I, I didn't listen. You know, I'm glad that we did connect, and Absolutely. I'm glad that we did connect um, beyond just you know the, the few times that we did did meet out out, out my way. Um, for me, you know, I'm 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 proud every time I see y'all do something. Man. I mean, when when 
when you guys do something, I feel like I did something. And I hope vice versa. When when I do something, it feels like y'all did something. Yes, sir. Absolutely. That's how this thing works, man. It's not, you know, I, I never, if, if you ever meet somebody who said they did something by themselves, they lying. <laughs> There's no such thing as a self-made person. That That's not real. Um, if, if, if they claim that, that's they lying to you. And everybody needs somebody. <laughs> He's up to self made three. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. Who, who, what other identity is he going to steal next? That's the, that's the question, you know, ask him. Even though, even though Rick, the real Rick Ross, lost that lawsuit, which, which is crazy. Well, cra yeah. yeah. Um, if, if it was the old Rick, the fat Rick wouldn't be here. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, but no, nah, it's it's been good, dude. It, it feels it feels good knowing that I got support and all day, every day. It feels good. It feels good knowing that, and, and I hope I hope you guys know that I got your back whenever you need me as well. It ain't it ain't nothing but a phone call or a quick email. Yes, sir. We do I know that. It's been great, you know, to see you guys grow and and uh, you know I try to pop on when I can and. Um, I'm I'm taking a break a little bit tonight. Thank uh, you. We thank you for that. Yeah, I got to speak to about about five thousand people on Saturday. I got to figure out what the hell I'm gonna say for fifteen minutes. <laughs> so, FedEx. Yeah, so that that's that's been a little that's been a little stressful only because I don't like to talk. So, you know, my 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 mom taught me early actions speak louder than words. And I, I've always been about my actions, never about my words. And it's just interesting now they want me to talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I'm still working through what the hell I'm going to talk about. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what comes out. Um, but, no, it, it's, I'm, I'm glad. I didn't even know it was 300 until you shot me that email. So I'm on my way home. Um, that's why I had to at least, you know, pop on and, and see what was going on and reconnect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Very much so. And um, I'm sure Darren does too. Yeah, it was it was good meeting you, man. I mean I wish you I wish you the best with what you're trying to do. I admire you because it's not easy. You know, it's it's not easy. People you know, it's 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 a lot like, you know well, I won't completely compare it to that, but it's a lot like when you when you see guys playing a sport. You only see the end result on TV. Mm. You don't you don't see what happens when the, when the, when the screen isn't on when when the camera isn't on. You don't you don't see you know the painful nights. You don't see all the stressful workouts. You don't see any of that stuff. Um, and sometimes you know people get caught up into just what they see instead of really the sacrifice that's happened for you to see that moment. Mm -hmm. And you know just just know that. Trust. I understand exactly what you're going through, and there's tons of every, there's tons of people, you know, in the same boat. It's just uh, you just got to decide what you want, why you're here, and what you're doing for. A friend of mine, uh, Kevin Carroll. I don't I don't know if he coined it first, but I heard him say it, so I give him credit for it. He said that there's two important dates in life. The one you were born, that's the first date. The second one is when you discover why. <laughs> when you were born and when you realized what you were born to do. Yep. I'm telling you, that's that's Kevin for you too. And, and most time we we don't even think about the second one. I was gonna say the second one, yeah. That's that's, that's more that's wow. obviously the first one is critical because you you have to be alive, but the second one, people go through their whole life not answering that question. Right. And, you know, when you don't answer that question, I question if you're actually living. Mm -hmm. Because when you discover why, then that's when things change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people change when they have kids because you're no longer living for yourself. You're trying, to, you're, trying to feed, you're trying to feed the people that you brought into this world. But sometimes it's, it's you know, what about you? Don't forget about you. Just because you've had kids and, and you have responsibilities you still got to live too. And I, I see a lot of people that I used to work with that they stopped living. 
they still breathing though. And they still collect the check. And they still have certain companies, but they're not living anymore. Mm -hmm. And they look at me when I show up like I'm a Martian, like I'm I'm alive and I'm living. I'm like, well, shit, you breathing too. We breathing the same air. Same air, yep, exactly. I just know what I'm breathing. That's the mm -hmm. difference. So, you know, I think any any business owner or any entrepreneur or anybody who wants to do something, you, you know, even you, Leo, I don't know if I don't know if you still on I don't know if you're still in the chat, but yeah, I'm, it's not yeah. right to fail because you don't learn from success. Yeah, nope. I'm here. What's up? You don't you don't learn from success, you learn from failure. And so you don't look at your, your previous failures as failure. You look at those as teaching moments for you not to do that shit again. <laughs> yep. So I'm I guarantee you you ain't gonna make the same mistake three times. <laughs> You might you might slip up and go again, but a third time, that's just wrong on your part. <laughs> but but you know we should always embrace failure because failure is 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 what keeps us going. Right? You know is is what keeps us not to do it again. Um, and you know this I guess this is the quote show you know but <laughs> the quote MJ, and, and what I, what I love about him dude is is uh he has this unquenching desire to not lose and be the best and one of the things that he's I remember him saying is in order to be good at something you have to love it if you don't love it you're not gonna be good at it mm -hmm. that's just not gonna happen so you need to decide if you really want to be good at it or I would say great at it because you can it's easy to strive to good great is a completely different level and I, and I tell my students, if you don't want to be great, leave. Because I don't want I don't want to mess with good people. I want to mess with great people. Because if if you shoot for great, you might get good. But if you just shoot for good, you might not even reach anything. So at least in failure, you still successful. So you should you should put on that great got great hat. If you ain't trying to be great, don't do it. True. Definitely don't do it. I'm trying to be great. <laughs> True, indeed. I got no choice. I'm trying to be great. I'm a little I'm a little school, but I'm making a big impact. And it it ain't about how how big the school is or how big you're trying to do stuff. It's the impact. You measure you measure by your impact. Yep. So, you know. Hang in there, man. You'll be all right. Yeah. Um, Dwayne, I have up on my screen. D can highlight that. Um, not sure if you saw these, but Jordan Brand has made some special shoes for TEDx. Yeah, I'm getting some. Um, the black ones, though. The, these are what they look like, white and black. Oh, Brand no, the ones, the ones... Uh, to the top of the screen. The black ones. The black ones with the uh, with the perfect on the bottom. So the top of the screen. Yeah, that one. Yep. Oh no, the arrows on the thing. I think those are the limited ones. I think. Are the white ones releasing? Do you know? I have no idea. I know I'm getting a pair of them. I don't care. One more time to I say this. Stunt. <laughs> yeah. Wait, they, they're, 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 you know both, they're both. They're both two hundred and thirty pairs. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, go ahead. That's the third time. Tell us, D. You still getting some though? I'm gonna get mine. You know, so that's <laughs> <laughs> that. That's right. That's what he was holding back. That's what I was waiting for. That's right. my boys yeah. at home. Here goes Trey. Yeah, what was, but you know what's funny is uh, I'm working, I'm working with those guys um, on you know organizing it and everything, and, and it's like I don't I don't even wear Nike or Jordan anymore really. I actually, I actually don't even own any Nikes, um, and I only wear two pair of Jordans, some original ones, and and then some some old 22s that are, that are, that are comfortable. But beyond that. I don't even wear Nike or Jordan anymore, so I'm kind of happy that I'm at least getting another pair to put in rotation. Yep. 
What are what you? What are you wearing? If you're not wearing those, what are, what are you wearing then? Man, I'm wearing. Um, let me see what's over here. Some Porsche Adidas running shoes. I just got some of them uh, Adidas blades. The uh, spring blades. Yeah. Ridiculous uh, enough those. A lot of a lot of Puma Black Label. They still make that. Alan loves that. Yeah. Yep, I still get some. <laughs> um, and then the, you know some a couple of things from Android, but it's just rotation, man. Whatever whatever I have in the closet, then I get rid of it and get something else. But um, but no, it's it's not like it's on purpose that I'm not wearing any of it. It's just I just don't have any. Um, I wanted to uh, I went to the stores recently because I've been missing. Goa domes lately. Mm. I've been really missing those, and I don't have a pair anymore. And they are now costing a hundred and sixty plus dollars. Yes, sir. They went up last year. They went up. Wow. I haven't looked in a while because yeah. you know I had a good pair for a long time. And well, only reason I know is because I wear them every day. I'm out. I'm out in the field. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So I, that's pretty much my work shoe. So I've seen them, you know, just to share with Dwayne, because I'm not sure if he's even bothered to look in any recent memory. But they are now, anywhere I see them in New York City, from 160 to $180. Wow. That's called capitalism, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Still the best boot I've ever put on, in my opinion. But... That's tough to pay. <laughs> My first pair I ever tried cost me forty five dollars. Yeah, that's below employee store price. <laughs> <laughs> this was at training camp. Training camp was damn near um, trying to liquidate at some point for renovation before they ultimately went out of business. Oh, and wow. I got a pair for forty. Actually, this is the time to get them. Uh, uh, pay. This is usually the best time to get them. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's not sitting still. When did Training Camp go out of business? Training Camp's been gone for a good two or three years now. Three years. Yeah, I remember I went down there, met with uh, Udi a number of years yeah. ago. They are all gone, wiped away. All yes. through your map. Yeah, wow. but this this is the time to get your gold on, so you might be able to come up on a pair for like... No, it's not. I just I, fin I just finished checking recently. That's what I'm telling you the prices are. Anywhere from... I'm saying in the yeah. next month or so, yeah, uh, so when it starts getting time. real hot, go online, go online, you can catch them. I know for a fact that uh, East Bay normally has them. The last pair I got, I got the uh, the tough, the, 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 what does it call it, the tough tech. Uh, joints, I got those, and they were like they went up ten dollars. Uh, regular price one seventy, I ended up getting them for like eighty bucks. Wow! But it was over the summertime. It was during summertime. Yeah, I'm gonna have to wait till July. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait till July, cause cause all of that right there is running shoe season. Time to pull out some fresh running shoes. Yes, sir. So D Wells. Unmute yourself, please. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm having issues all of a sudden at this late hour with this episode, but nonetheless. It is 12.32 yeah. Eastern Standard Time. Time has definitely flown by. We, yeah. we have to, we have to, We even though we broke midnight, mm -hmm. and we're on to the next day. we we got to say rest in peace and we miss you to oh, our man. Mateo Mulcair, Absolutely. who uh, is, is one of the... This, this, the driving forces behind you, you and I ultimately meeting and um, doing some of the things that have brought us down this crazy road, this yep. sneaker wonderland, if you will. Um, yesterday, March, April 9th, rather, made um, five years that he has been gone. Um, I keep re forgetting to show Dwayne, if I haven't showed him already, exactly who this gentleman was and what he meant to us and Dwayne and I both being car guys. He was the creator of this magazine, Dwayne. Oh, uh, okay. yeah, I remember you talked to me about that. Okay, all right. So, very very talented graphic designer, worked for The Source, and record labels, and a bunch of other things. Um, in that Biggie and Tupac freestyle where Biggie says, peace to Mateo, hmm. that's actually the Mateo who Biggie was talking about. 
Um, Mateo was also a very good and talented MC and was also around the same time um, possibly going to be signed to Bad Boy, but he got there shortly after Big was already signed. Wow. Um, so he was just as good. Um, D grew up with him in the Virgin Islands. I met him here. Um, he would keep telling me from the time I began to work with him at Plush Magazine that I need to meet this guy up in Massachusetts who does this <laughs> thing for the sneaker magazine. His name is D. How did you not know him? You've got to know him. I'm pretty sure you've met him. I was like, nope, nope, nope. And then Chris Vidal connected us yep. at Flight Club on Green Street, and the rest is history. So yep. five years ago, April 9th, he passed away. Um, the funny thing about that is it's exactly one month after his friend Biggie passed away. Wow. March 9th and April 9th. So shout out to Chris Vidal. Don't know what happened to him tonight. He was supposed to pop on and uh, right. give us some of his uh, New York style Puerto Rican ramblings <laughs> and new things. But uh, he didn't do so. But another one who's a big supporter of OSD and helped us out in the beginning and, you know, Gave us a couple of really big looks in the beginning. Went on Spike TV, repping us, and you know he's done quite a few things to help us, you know, further the awareness for the OSD brand too. Thank you, Chris. Love you, homie. Catch you soon over at the Superstore. Um, we'll be back next week for episode number three hundred and one. Man, that sounds weird. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I don't know. We might have to. We might have to visit possible retirement soon, since David Letterman is retired. I'm telling you, right? <laughs> we may have to start talking about what we're gonna do to get this shit up. We're gonna have to figure <laughs> out. We're gonna ask, uh, you know, Darren to find that 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 kid from the sneaker social. Yeah. Get him to be the host. The eight-year-old. The eight-year-old. Yeah. Little Riley. Little Riley from the Boondocks. Little Riley. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Let's groom Man. him now. <laughs> you gonna wear those? Exactly. Give him a seat and a microphone. Right. <laughs> Tell him you want a hit. Give me an hour plus a pen and a pad. But you I know, know. I, I cannot lie. I do sometimes think about who would be in these chairs replacing all of us when we don't oh, do this man. anymore. Real. Have you guys ever thought about that? Because I do sometimes now. Think about who would be here doing the shit that we do and saying what we say. Terrorizing brands like APL who are scared to come. <laughs> it's wild, you know, man. I was, I, was I, was just, like, I, was, I was just in China, man, and I saw some new APL stuff. Uh-oh. Stop, stop. You saw their new running shoe? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I didn't think we were going to have a WTF tonight, so. <laughs> oh, let me dig this up. Allow me as we close the show. Allow me. I didn't know they were still making shoes. Yes, they are. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let me. Yes, they are. My hand is up. <laughs> APL running. APL running. Yeah, they're 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 still lock. They're locking low technology. They're promoting it. They're pushing it. They now yeah, crossed yeah, over yeah, into running. You're... But where where are they selling it though? <sighs> Only their their point of sale is only on their site right now, isn't it? It seems so. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. No, nothing wrong with it. It's just. Oh no, nothing, nothing we, wrong with we've that. Been, we've been trying to get a, them on the show, uh, Darren, for a while now to, to yeah. give us a story. You and know, if you knowing, give me a choice, I'm gonna go with the LA Gear Catapult. I'm just yeah. saying. No, to now, learn now. more beyond what they did. You know, I mean, we know there's some connections to, you know, uh, their father and Reebok and some other stuff. So they know industry folks. Now I say I say I say this in in all sarcastic wit. Running shoe. It's really a low top basketball shoe. But when I show you guys this, you're gonna see why I said running shoe. Well, let me see if it's the one that I saw over there. Probably. There you go. <laughs> see that? No. Oh, let me look at this. Okay, so it's a it's a slim down, cut down version of their bat. Yeah, it definitely is. It looks like a Kobe. Yeah. No, it looks play. like a lunar it's running shoe. It's a Kobe. Uh, it's a Kobe. It's a lunar. It's a. 
It's got that cross trainer. Cross tr- cross yeah, that cross, cross trainer on the you know medial side there. I mean, it's got. Oh, it's got man. everything. Oof. They threw the kitchen sink at it. It's get low, go low. Get high, go low. Okay. Sounds like a bread man and method man song title. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. It does say first. It says low top basketball, so it's not saying yeah. running. No, I, I, I said jokingly running because it looks like some yeah. Nike running oh, okay. shoes. Oh, yeah. no, uh, so I saw some running shoes. When oh, I got it. something else. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh. you, saw, you saw some other shit, Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> you saw some other, other. <laughs> uh, man. Where are we going to see those Keith yet? Swiss is putting out. Drew. What's that, Darren? I said it's better than anything K-Swiss is putting out. Hey, K Swiss still has the classic. What does APL have? Um, I don't know. for everybody, I guess. Yeah. So get high, go low. So they're hitting you, hit, hitting us with their low top version of their basketball, you know, sneaker. They still no. got them rusty ass springs in the bottom, huh? First basketball, you know, first basketball t- low top sneaker to, with the patent lock and launch technology. Okay. Lock, load and launch. Only load one launch with that technology, right? <laughs> load and launch technology. I, I don't know. I mean, everyone else, like like Steve said, it would be catapult. Catapult, um, baby, all day yeah. long. If you, if I, if Carl I Malone, load, baby. Carl Malone, hit you with yep. that. Yo, I got you. I want to see somebody dissect these like they did the first APLs oh, when they showed the rusty springs. Mm, mm, mm. Them, pr- them springs uh, that look like Spira have a patent on that? Say again? Doesn't Spira have the patent That's... on the rusty springs? I think well, uh, on a, on a, maybe it's a different spring. Well, these rusty springs that we saw in here, I'll send you the email, the, the link to the APL dissected of their first basketball shoe, and you can tell me. Yeah. So all I saw in the bottom of these shoes was some rusty springs that looked like a pen dropped in water, a and pen. then you get up exactly. five minutes later, yep. and you took it apart. The spring always fall out the top. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Well, we're still going to try to get them on the show at some point. We would love to have them on. Please come on. Please. We gotta, we gotta stop. We gotta stop bashing them in. Yeah, we gotta yeah. stop it. I like APL. I like the shoes. I really like them. Reverse psychology. Let me get a pair. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. In all fairness, Mr. Ridiculous, Steve Ridiculous Gordon, he won a pair. Yeah, he won a pair. I sure did. And he wanted them to come on. He gave them a a very nice review. Nice. It was was a legit enough shoe. I want to know about them springs, though. No, and, see, and, ridiculous. And they were asked to come ridiculous on to is the only one, though. Like the rest of us would be killing them. But wait, oh, <laughs> but wait, but wait. In all seriousness, in all seriousness, if ridiculous one one gave them a nice, you know, thank you for the packaging, the way they came, presentation, whole nine yards. They yep. were solicited and asked to come on the show, right? Right. And numerous times they were asked. To the point where they blocked me and Feeway on social media because they just didn't want to have to explain why they were charging three hundred dollars for their basketball shoe. And that was one thing that I said in my review. I'm like, they're not a they're not a three hundred dollar shoe. Uh, the packaging was nice. I got that first band edition that they had, and I got it as a as a as part of the the contest. And Paper and I even talked about this privately, but I go ahead and put it out there. I'm like, I wonder. If they were trying to get a favorable review, you know, thinking I would hype it up, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna give it a straight flat review. It's a nice package. Yeah, it's they not packaged that real nice review. <laughs> yeah. They packaged that real nice review. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it wasn't a three hundred dollar shoe, and then somebody asked me that I I took it to the court to go play. I'm I'm already able to dunk and jump. I'm an athlete. I play ball, and uh, they didn't help me. He didn't even clap boards that day. <laughs> no, he didn't. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody, somebody LeBron blocked my shot that day. No, no, Mason Plumley blocked your shot that day. I got Plumley. I got Plumley. <laughs> sure. That boy can get up, boy. Yeah, yeah he can. And LeBron knows okay, it you, you see, he, 
he he blocked that shot and then kumbaya him. He was like, let's hold hands. Right. Let's lay hands on the way down. Let us pray for the loss of this game. <laughs> oh, man. But in all seriousness, before we end the show, I mean, seriously, APL, Darren Hager from Heyday Footwear just came on and bared his soul and allowed us to discuss at length his brand. And he's not charging $300 for his shoes exactly. and claiming that they make you jump higher. Unless it's Brazil. I was listening. I was listening. It's Brazil. Yeah, I know. Unless it's Brazil. We get that. <laughs> But across the board, he didn't say you're gonna dance yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he didn't say you're gonna get rocked up in the gym more. He didn't say you're gonna be take. He didn't say you're gonna take Michael Flatley's place in River Dance, Lord of the Dance, when you wear Heyday footwear. <laughs> nope. He, he didn't say get on so you can dance though. Well, I'm about to say, he did say you get more ass with these shoes. With his yeah. shoes. <laughs> That's right on the website. With Bella? <laughs> ah. He said that's on the website. I love that. Exactly. Front and center. <laughs> Just oh, some Brazilian ass with these shoes. There it is. Right. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Thumbs up for the big man. Yep. Right. Look, look over your shoulder. Your wife's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, D. Oh, man. All right. So, D, we got to wrap this up. We're back next mm. week. Episode 301. Yeah, say something. around the world. T so Squad. Yep. Social studies students. Tariq, try to say something. Yes, sir. All right. So, this week, Friday, I'm going to send an email out. We're doing a raffle. For two halves make me whole. Yep. And the prize in the raffle. Come on now. Supreme. Supreme foam posits. So you gotta buy the book, and you'll get you know put in the raffle and drawn out. So what size? What size are the sneakers? Um, eleven. Okay, and where folks go and get the book? Where can they buy the book? Um. I'm going to email everybody that information because we're doing it all through PayPal, not okay. through uh, the Amazon stuff. But for, gotcha. uh, for Darren and, and, and Dwayne, my girlfriend wrote this book. It's about co-parenting. It's through her son's, um, like, you his know, from, yeah, from his perspective. Uh, one parent in Atlanta, one parent in Kansas City. Hmm. Uh, so email will go out, and then you guys can enter too. Dwayne, you can <laughs> win and you can have ease, man. Oh, man. Hey, 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 email me directly, hey, uh, hey, hey, Sean or, or D. Give him my email directly. I'll definitely buy the book. I don't need the shoes, though. I okay. got you. Uh, but nah, Dwayne, we you don't need put, no Versace, 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 Versace. We need to put them in, we need to put them in your rotation, D.E. That's you know what I'm saying. Wear. D, you can put them in the rotation, man. <laughs> uh, I believe people Dwayne believe like showed with those shoes on the Inglewood beatdown. <laughs> hey, hey, Leo, hey, Leo, hey, Leo, I heard you, bro. Inglewood is red. It's the same. It's the same. Exactly. Color. Right. Right. Hey, Leo, I heard you. That's why Inglewood I'm raffling. Red, but it ain't gold. <laughs> I mean, I, you know what? I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I wish you much success. You know what I'm saying with the raffle, but shoes are ugly, yo. I like. I just don't get it. Hey, I don't get it neither. But I'm raffling them. They gonna do it. Yeah, you you about to kill with the raffle. Matter of fact, I, let me know. I'll put it out there. Books. Yeah, I, um, I got the uh, the Instagram flyer already made. It'll be all in the email with all the details and information on the book. Nice. Shoot it on over. We'll push it out. Make sure yeah. I get oh, it. Oh, oh. Uh, I got, we got you. Let me go ahead and put the, push this out. We just got saying, word. I, I already got a, uh, a nice uh, email from uh, Rox, Rox Fontaine. Yep. Ooh. The fresher uh, than your average, the last winner of the fresher than your average sneaker battle. Uh, with some, you know, some, some interesting... Uh, Commentary and feedback, and I don't, I don't remember who. If I saw Rocks, is Rocks a boy or a girl? Um, the guy about six yeah, feet. Probably two, check six it was a guy. All right. Oh, well, well, if Rocks is still on there, I will. I will uh, reply back to you tomorrow. Yeah, he might be still watching. All right. So Rocks, yeah. I will reply back. What up, Rocks? I'm just, I'm just fading here. Yep. I usually go to bed I about nine. You, Darren, thank you again for coming on, man, yeah, and, and being time. as real and, and and open book as you were. Because I'm pretty sure there are people somewhere who are going to watch this afterwards. The ones that weren't watching it live now will watch this afterwards, and they're going to really get a whole lot of food for thought from this, especially if they're the type of people who thought that 
creating your own sneaker brand was easy. Um, and that's the platform that we, you know, we have here for people to learn those things. We don't well, care how, how do you do it. How about if I also give you guys a promo code to use on the website? Uh, yes, sir. For your fans. So, uh, OSD Live uh, promo code on HeyDayFootwear.com. Give you 20 bucks off for the next week. What's up? Thank you, sir. Sweet. I will do that right now. The biggest size you carry, yo. Hey, fellas, I'm about to head out. All right. Bye, guys. Good talking to you, man. Thanks, everybody. Right. Send me that, right. Thank send me you, that um, Send me that, Tariq, and, I, and I'll, I'll get a couple of books. Please. I got you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Right, Peace. Peace, guys. All, All right. right. Y'all be safe. Peace, Darren. Thank you. It's been good. It's been fun. It's time oh, to wrap hey, up. Whoa, whoa. Look who just popped on, though. He on CPT time. <laughs> It's been good. It's been fun. It's time to stick a fork in it. It's episode 300. Man, thank you all for tuning in as you do each and every week. Make sure you come back and walk with us, talk with us next week as we record and talk episode 301. We have a great show in store for you then, but certainly salute and thank you to Darren Hager of Heyday Footwear. Thanks for being our guest on the show as well as Dwayne Edwards, as long as the Soul Doctors and DeSorleys. Y'all be good. Y'all be safe. Come back. Walk with us. Talk with us. And until then, we're up, up, and out. Word up. Turn it up. Fresh at them, yeah, me there in a delay, that's aware. Them chance me or your career. You know, you're not going to wear. You're not just one like Trump.